Hey guys, and welcome back to a new amazing video. And in this video, we will build something new, something that I don't have on my channel yet in this form. We're going to build a multi-platform app. So an app that runs on Android and on iOS. As you can see, I have two emulators open here. The left one is an iPhone 14 Pro, so definitely an Apple device. And the right one is just our Android emulator we are used to. And we're going to build this awesome Node app that it's yeah, just a simple CRUD app. We can uh, create nodes, we can uh, yeah, just uh, go to the node detail screen. As you can see, each node has a color. It's a bit similar as the node app tutorial that I already have, just that now we actually get an iOS app as well out of that. And we can, yeah, this is how it looks like if we create a node, so we can enter a title, hello YouTube, and we can enter some content, this is content of my test node for example and if we then click on this little check mark we're going to save it and it's at the bottom of our list we could also order this so that it's at the top of our list and if we want to update a node we can click on it we can go to the title say updated click on the check mark and then you can see the title is updated we can of course also delete notes by clicking on this little x we can search for notes here's the little search button then we get a little search bar and here we could search for test and then it will search in real time for our notes and the same will of course also work on android looks a little bit different here so you can also see that it's really two native apps that we get out of this so on android we have these typical android ui components like a floating action button you will likely not see that on ios um, because ios has kind of different conventions here we actually added that to the toolbar so each app really looks like it was made for the platform it runs on and just to show you that the android app also works perfectly fine here we can update our node click check there's our update we can also let's add a new one this is a new note um, and some content this is some content click check there's our new node we can delete them that works we can search for them if we search for this then it stays there if we search for something that doesn't match then we simply won't display that node and all this will be powered by KMM, Kotlin Multi-Platform Mobile. That means that we can yeah, kind of have a shared module, a shared module of code, which only consists of Kotlin code that we share between both platforms. And that allows us to share, on the one hand, data source. So if we would have an API or database, we could share that logic to actually make our request, to make our queries to our DB. In this case, we just have a local database. And we can also share our business logic. For example, the logic behind searching these nodes because that's really platform independent. We don't really need to write this logic twice for each platform. That wouldn't really make a lot of sense. But what is really platform specific though is the UI layer. So the UI needs to be explicitly implemented in both iOS using Swift and Swift UI, which you will also learn in this video. And on Android, we'll use Jetpack Compose as you will probably be used to on my channel here. So the idea behind KMM is just that we get two apps but we only implement the parts natively that really need to be done natively because they differ from platform to platform and a little note if you actually also want to build the ios app here then you actually need a mac or at least mac os some kind of access to a mac os system and xcode since that needs to be done there that's a requirement from apple we can't change that sadly but if you have that and if you fulfill all these requirements then what you need to do if you don't know yet how to create a KMM project because that really deserves its own video and I already made that so you can uh, check the link down in this video's description where you will find yeah, just a video of mine where I show you how you can actually uh, create a KMM project what kind of prerequisites you need to be able to create that and if you know that then we will still create it from scratch here I will show you how to paste all the dependencies and stuff like that um, but I won't go over it in that much detail as I do in the video that I linked down below so if you already know how to do that or you watch this video then you will yeah just go to Android Studio and you create a new project so you see this kind of dialog you will probably not see this for the first time so let's scroll down and here we can actually go to Kotlin multi-platform app that's what we want to do Let's select that, we can click next. We need to give our application a name. We can say um, node app KMM, for example. We can leave the package name as it is and we can actually 
click next. We could give our Android application a name. So the Android module, I will actually just leave this as it is here. And we can also choose an iOS framework distribution, which is currently set to Cocoa Pods. Um, that's yeah, just a dependency manager that allows us to easily add dependencies on iOS. So if we only have iOS specific dependencies, for example, some kind of uh, custom view that only works for iOS that was written in Swift, we could easily add that dependency with this dependency manager. However, um, iOS works a little bit differently than Android in terms of dependencies because the, the core foundation of the platform is already included in what we get with Xcode directly. So for example, we don't need a specific dependency for navigation as we do with Android in Compose. Um, so in this project, we actually don't need this easier managing of uh, dependencies since that also requires some additional setup, which I don't want to do here. So we can click on this and select regular framework and click a finish. And here is my new project that I just created. Gradle will finish building here, hopefully, and that will take a little bit. And then I will see you back. And there we go, our KMM app finished building. And here we're currently on the Android view, which we want to switch to um, project view. Since then we also are able to see our iOS app module, which we will only add it in Xcode since Android Studio doesn't support iOS code. But it's yeah, just a little bit easier to navigate here if we use this project view. And the first thing I wanna do is I wanna actually set up the dependencies that we need for this project. If you don't care about this part and you just want to get the initial project that uh, you can start working with for this video, then you can just get all this code down below from my GitHub. But since uh, this is something quite new that I do in my channel here with KMM, I also want to show you how it works to add these dependencies manually. So you can also do this in your own projects at home. And the first thing I want to do or I want to set up is in our shared module. You can see here we have shared and this is the module where we put all of our shared code that is shared, yeah, well, between iOS and Android. And here we also have a build at Gradle KTS file, which is a normal Gradle file in a Kotlin style. And here we can simply put our dependencies. If we scroll down to source sets, that's the place where we want to do this. And here we have common main. And that is the uh, kind of, uh, yeah, it's a module. If we can uh, open source here, we see common main. That's the module where we put all the code that is directly shared between each platform. However, we also have Android main and iOS main in which we can kind of put code that's shared, but that differs a little bit for each platform. So if we take a look here, then this platform file is basically just an implementation of the iOS platform. Since the initial app just prints out the version of the device, uh, of the operating system, I mean, and that's of course different for Android and iOS, but in the end, that's just a string which we can share. So that's why we have three modules here. Um, we don't need to care too much about that. I will go more into this when we actually need to put some classes in these um, modules. Let's just go to common main by getting, and we open um, braces here. And here we can now put our dependencies just as we are used to in Gradle. And I will simply post this here from my prepared project, and then I will explain it. Again, you will find these exact strings in my GitHub repository down in this video's description. So first of all, what we want to share is SQL Delight. That is a database, a local one, that is purely written in Kotlin code and supports KMM. So whenever you use a library in KMM in the shared module, that needs to be written in pure native uh, Kotlin code so that it actually is able to run on iOS as well. So we, for example, couldn't use things like retrofit here or room since that's very Android specific and uh, was written in Java. But here SQL Delight is a, is a popular database that works with iOS as well or with a KMM project. And we have the Kotlin X daytime library, which just allows us to um, have all these local daytime uh, classes that we usually also have on Android, but these are also written in Java and come from Java. So we need kind of a way to share these classes between Android and iOS. And that's why we also have a Kotlin specific library for that, which is a little bit more trash, I must say. Um, so the, the actual Java library is a lot better. Uh, but I wanna show you how you can actually also use this because you often need to deal with the dates in the shared module of a KMM project. Next up, we wanna scroll down to Android main. And here we also wanna add a dependencies block in which I will paste this line. And there's also an SQL Delight dependency, but here for the Android side, we need a specific Android SQL Delight driver, which just needed to create the Android specific database. 
Um, and since that's only required for Android, we will put it in Android main because it doesn't make sense to create an Android driver for iOS. For iOS, we can just use the Kotlin native driver. So the one you would also use for desktop apps, for example. And that's what we want to do. We want to scroll down to iOS main. And here, before all that, we want to also add our dependencies. Dependencies. And here we add this SQL Delight native driver. So that only is now only available for the iOS side where we need this. And one more thing we need to do here in this shared build.gradle file is we need to scroll up and add a plugin. And that plugin will be, well, as well for SQL Delight. So that will actually be like the way we will implement an SQL Delight database as we define how to create it in an SQL file, um, just an SQL language. And then it will yeah just generate the corresponding entity classes and all the functions on compile time. So when we build our project and then we can use it in our project similar as with Room. And that should be it for our Build.Gradle shared module, but we have more Build.Gradle files in our project, which we need to set up here. For example, this Build.Gradle project file here on the root level, if we open this up, then you will also kind of uh, see something that looks familiar to you because we know this from Android already. It just uh, was in Gradle Groovy for Android. Here it's Gradle Kotlin, but not a big difference. And this actually looks a bit different from uh, when I created my project that I prepared here. Um, I'm not very familiar with this way of specifying my Gradle file. I'm sure this is just because I updated Android Studio since then, but we should be able to just replace this with what I have. This might look much more familiar to you. And all we really care about here, or what's the real difference, is these two class paths here. On the one hand, again, for SQL Delight, so it finds that Gradle plugin. And on the other hand, Dagger Hilt. So we will be using Dagger Hilt for the Android app just as usual. I will talk more about DI here in uh, this video and how we do this on iOS. But for now, that is fine. And there is one last Gradle file missing and that is for the Android app. So for the Android specific code, and that's just as usual. So here we can put in anything we like that works on Android here. We can put in Java dependencies, basically, yeah, whatever we want. And you can see Compose is already set up here in the previous Android Studio version. That was not the case, which is cool. So if we actually open up source here, Java and main activity, then oh, we even get a theme already. So uh, it just created a Compose project for us, which is cool. We don't need to set this up, but we still want to add some dependencies here. On the one hand, that is this bunch of code. We have Kotlin Daytime again, so we can also use this on the Android side. And we have Dagger Hilt. Here we need to add capped, so Kotlin annotation processing. So we scroll up to plugins and here we add our two plugins that we need for Kotlin capped and the Dagger plugin, since we will be using Dagger, of course, here for this module. And something else is we need some compile options. And here we want to set is core library desugaring enabled. That just allows us to use the Java daytime library from API level 21 and onwards instead of 26 and onwards. And then we can also scroll down and add a dependency that's needed for that, which is this core library desugaring. And I actually needed to use this version. So um, you can try updating this, but uh, maybe you get an error and then you need to use this 1.1.5 version instead. Um, we will see in the course of this video if there are any issues. For capped, I think it should be recognized as soon as we synchronize this with Gradle here. Let's actually do that and pray that we don't get any Gradle issues. There we go. I did not get any build issues, which is good. We can also update the compile SDK to 33, by the way, and the target SDK as well. So we just target the latest Android version. Let's synchronize this again. And then we should be able to at least try to launch it. Let's do this here on my emulator just the Android app. This is nothing different. Let's take a look here. And if everything goes well, we should see an Android app here that tells us the current API level of this Android device. And yes, that is exactly what's happening. Very cool. Here we see Hello Android 28. And if you launch this on iOS, you will see Hello iOS, whatever iOS this iPhone is running on. We will run our iOS later, later and I will show you how to do that. For now, we will actually, first of all, start to build the shared part of our code. So the SQL database, the business logic behind that, our domain models. Um, this will be in a clean architecture style, as you usually like that. And then we will build the Android app. 
so the Android UI in JPEG Compose and everything that belongs to that. And then we will finally worry about the iOS part. So at the end of this video, you will have a working multi-platform node app with CRUD, with everything you like, and you will have a very good understanding of KMM in general to also be able to build your very own first um, simple KMM app. But before we get started, one more thing. If you are currently considering yourself an intermediate Android developer who, you know, can build simple apps, but you kind of always end up with spaghetti code, you struggle to make the step into the corporate world and be fully prepared for a job, then I got something for you. Wouldn't it be cool if we could actually work one-to-one -to -one together and I help you directly to become an industry-ready Android developer? Some months ago, I launched the first round of my 10-week mentorship program and the results people achieved so far are crazy. Some already found a job before the round actually ended. They feel a lot more confident when it comes to building Android apps and they just stop feeling lost when it comes to making design decisions. And because people achieved such great results, I'm now launching this 10 week mentorship program again. However, this will really be the last chance to directly work with me together for this year. And as much as I want to, I sadly can't offer this to every one of you since, yeah, you know, my day also only has 24 hours and that's why I can only only offer a very limited number of spots here. But if you are a very committed Android developer who really wants to become the best version of yourself, then uh, click the first link in this video's description. You will find all the infos, how this will work, what you will get, and also how you can actually apply for this. And if you are a fit, then I will get back to you. I sadly can't get back to you if you're not a fit because, you know, last time I got 800 applications, over 800 now, in just two days or so. So, uh, that's just too much to uh, just write a personal note for everyone, sadly, as much as I want to. But if you are a fit, I will definitely get back to you and I will let you know of further steps. So do check it out. Click the first link in this video's description. If you want to become industry ready, this is really the fastest way to do that. I will directly help you to do that. We will have code reviews. We will have calls, all that stuff. You will find it down below. And now let's enjoy the video. So let's First of all, start to actually implement our database. So as I said, we will start with a shared module and our database is shared between Android and iOS. So what we want to do is we want to actually set up one more thing in Gradle because that's the way SQL Delight works. We want to go to our shared module where our SQL database is located. We want to scroll completely to the bottom or above this Android section. And here we want to have an SQL Delight section like this. And in this section, we just mentioned the name of our database so of the class that will be generated. We can say database, specify a name, I will call it node database, node database. And in here, we can simply configure that that is very simple. All we need to do is we need to specify a package name of that database, which is simply com PL coding in my case, or did I call it node app KMM? And we can see that database, for example. And then we want to set the source folders to a list of SQL Delight. So that will simply be a folder that is generated um, by SQL Delight. Not the folder is generated, but uh, the um, database is inside of that folder, which SQL Delight will use to generate some classes for us. We need to create that manually. So just this SQL Delight database folder. So we go to our shared module and directly in source, or actually not in source, we want to put this in common main because that's where our database will go. Here we can create a new folder, um, new directory, and we call this SQL Delight. In that we want to have our database folder and in that we're going to create a database file. If you don't, or well, haven't used SQL Delight yet, you actually need a plugin for that in Android Studio. If you open the settings here, then go to plugins, go to installed this, uh, where is it? Let me check. Um, let's search for SQL Delight. Yes, this is the plugin you actually need which works with Android Studio. Not sure if you need this, but it just adds a lot of support um, for just writing SQL code here in Android Studio. Just install this plugin, relaunch Android Studio, and you're good. Then you should have this option to create, uh, I don't have this option, but we can directly create a file in here, um, which is called node.sq. That is the format of this. Um, actually, let's do it like this, new, file node.sq. Yes, I want to add that to Git and 
we can now specify our SQL code here. You can see that's highlighted because we have this plugin. Let's also synchronize this, by the way, which we changed here in Gradle. Maybe that was the reason I didn't get this extension. And by the way, what I'm just seeing here, the compile SDK should be 33 for Android. Let's synchronize this again. So this is just for the Android main of our shared module. Cool. Um, so now you can also see that it recognizes our SQL file here, um, which yeah was just because we didn't sync this. We can now open this and here we specify how our SQL database actually looks like. The first thing we need to do is we need to specify exactly that. So our database schema. In this case, we only have one single table which represents a node. And we can do this with create table if not exists. Um, if not exists or just create table since yeah that should be enough because we just do this once and the table will be called a node entity just like that and here we specify the different fields in sql language that a node entity actually has the first thing is an id which is just an integer we say that's not nullable it is our primary key and we want to auto increment this then the next field would be our title which is simply a string so we can say text not null. We have the same for the content of our node, also not null. We want to be able to save a color hex for that node so that we also save the color, which is an integer, not null. And we want to save the created timestamp, which is also an integer and not null, so that we know when this node was created. We follow this up with a semicolon to finish this SQL expression. And now we can actually define our different queries that we have with our SQL database. So how we want to retrieve nodes, how we want to insert nodes, all this stuff. First of all, when I have a function, get all nodes, colon, and now we specify the SQL expression, how this looks like. So how we basically retrieve all nodes. That's very simple. We just want to select everything from node entity, and that's it. We can uh, finish this off with a semicolon again. And then SQL Delight or the plugin, the Gradle plugin, will generate a class, which will be for our node database, and that will have functions to get all nodes. In this case, it will be called get all nodes, and it will just execute this SQL statement here. We want to have a function get node by ID, which will be like this select everything from node entity. And here we have a condition, so we can say where the ID is equal to question mark. So that's the way we actually use parameters in SQL Delight. So if we have one question mark, SQL Delight will know, okay, there is a parameter and it will generate this function with exactly one parameter. So we can pass this ID and it will simply replace it here. Next up, inserting nodes. So we can say insert or replace. So if we insert a node with an ID that already exists in our DB, we will replace it. And we can say into node entity, that's where we want to insert that, so into which table. And here we can define the values you want to insert, which is ID, just all of our values in the end. Ah, come on. <laughs> Title, content, what else, color hacks, and create a timestamp. And then we can specify these values with values. And here we just mention five question marks, since we, also, we, we want to keep all this up to us. So what we insert, then this function will be generated with five parameters that we can pass. And as a last thing, we want to be able to delete a node. So we can say delete from node entity, where ID is equal to the ID we pass. Um, and actually, we give this a name, delete node by ID. We also actually need to give this a name, which is insert node. Cool. So that is already our SQL file. I hope that's clear. It's a very simple SQL in this case. But if we now rebuild our project, then SQL Delight should actually generate the class for this. And maybe we can already see this if the build is finished. It is finished. If we now, for example, go to common main and yeah, I don't know, greeting, and we would want to use our SQL database here, then we could, for example, say private val DB is a note. Nope, that was not generated, um, but node entity was. So here, node entity that comes from our database. If we take a look, um, yeah, that's how we can create a node entity. So that was properly generated. I'm not sure about the database yet, but we will see that when we get to the point of actually creating that. And we can actually also get rid of these two classes of greeting and platform. We don't need these, simply delete them here. Delete anyway. We delete them here in iOS main as well, the platform file and an Android main as well. 
Cool. So now what we want to start with is we want to create our node domain model. So in common main, that's now a logic that is shared between iOS and Android because in the end a node domain model just does not contain any secret information. We, we can only use natively on iOS or only on Android, so we can share it. And we can say domain, um, new directory. Actually, that should not be a directory. Um, but it seems like Android doesn't really recognize that this is a package or it might be because it's not an Android module. Let's just say directory here. We say domain and inside domain, we can create a new Kotlin class of file called node will be a data class. And since we will be using clean architecture here, the way this will work is we will get our node entity from our database, the, the type of class I just showed you. And we will then map this to such a node object here that we can use in our domain layer, which means all of our other layers are allowed to access this node. And here we simply specify a more convenient version for us to work with, for example, with a local date time object, which is just easier to work with than a timestamp, which we save in our database. So in here, we start off with an ID, which is a nullable long. Let's actually not set this to null by default. Um, we want to have a title, which is a string, content, which is a string, we want to have a color hex, which is a long, and we finally want to have our created timestamp, which is our local date time from the Kotlin date time library, like this. And something I also want to do is I want to set up some colors, basically the colors a node can have. And I'm not sure if this is not the best approach, but uh, I think it makes sense to share these colors in form of hex format. So this color hex format here, so that we just define these colors at one place in our shared module, since if they then change, we don't need to change them on iOS and Android. We just need to change them in the shared module. However, the disadvantage of that is that we just don't have this kind of theme management on each platform, which on Android works with Compose and on iOS works with Assets. Um, so we can't do this. And it's also a little bit of a pain to convert a color hex long to an actual iOS color on iOS level, you will see that later. Still, I wanna use this approach here and in our node app KMM directory, we can create a new directory. So in common main called presentation since colors are presentation related. And in here we can then create our colors file where we just specify the colors our nodes can have. And I'll just paste the five different colors a node can have here since yeah, I don't need to type these hex codes off. Feel free to do that or just also copy this over from my Yitta repository. We now want to specify these colors as a list. So we could say in here, we have a companion object and we say val colors, actually make this a private val. And we set this to a list of all of our colors. We have red, orange hex, red, pink hex, we have uh, green, light green hex, we have baby blue, and we have violet. Ah, violet. And now we want to have a function here to generate a random color because that's the way we will actually choose a color for a new node. So generate random color. And we can say, yeah, that's just colors that random. And yeah, we just put this in here. So this logic is shared. We don't need to uh, actually add this randomized logic to both iOS and Android. And that's the whole idea behind KMM, that we can actually share such code. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna create a little util class for using our date time objects that we added here in our node, this one here, the, the Kotlin version of this local date time object. Um, because uh, on iOS, we can kind of use these classes like this Kotlin local date time class, but it's a pain because in the end this gets compiled to Swift code or kind of translated to it. And it's a pain to work with that. So we kind of want to have some utility functions that just allow us to easier work with that on iOS. And we want to do this in, let's go to domain and create a little time directory here. We could also create a node directory for the node, by the way, so node, and we can drag in the node file in there refactor and in time we're going to create a file called date time util will be an object and in here we will have three functions on the one hand a function that just retrieves the current local date time so now and that's very easy we can just say we return local date time um, dot actually not that one we want to say return clock dot system 
now and that returns an instant which we can then transform uh, transform to a local date time object with this here and here we need to pass a time zone which this uh, local date time should have so this is a little bit different than the java api of this because for java we have a local date time and a zone date time object so the zone date time contains time zone information while the local date time does not here it seems like there's just one for both since we need to pass a time zone but we can simply say time zone current system default. We also want to have a function to take such a local date time object and convert it to milliseconds, so normal timestamp. So two epoch millis returns a long, and we can return um, local date time. We actually want to pass this here as a date time object, basically what we want to transform to milliseconds. We can return date time to instant so we convert it to an instant which we can then convert to milliseconds and here we can again pass time zone current system default to epoch milliseconds and one last function i want to do here is a little bit longer one and that is to format a date for our um, node so that is the wrong app here, so here we display that formatted date. That's a bit hard with KMM because this API with local date time does not support formatting dates yet, I think but we can still kind of manually create this kind of string and yeah it just helps us to share this but it's also in my opinion totally reasonable to not share this and just use the normal date time formatters of each platform here to do this ios will have one and on android we can just use the normal java api but i want to show you uh, i want to show you how you can share this so let's have a third function called format date for or format node date takes a date time object and returns a string so the formatted version and here we can simply work with the string builder but first of all just get all the different fields first of all the month that will be date time month dot name dot lowercase so we just have a lowercase a month we want to take the first three characters of this so we just yeah abbreviate a little bit for our format and then we say replace first character with it.uppercase. So we just capitalize it. Just like that. Then next up we will have the day. Here we want to check if the date time day of month is less than 10 because then we want to append a leading zero. I don't know if we see this here. No. But if uh, yeah, this would for example be September 9th then uh, we would actually want to write September 09. So if that's less than 10, we say zero and we append the date of, uh, day of month and else we just say, yeah, day of month. Then uh, for the year, that's easy. That's just day time dot year. And then for the hour, I want to do the same as for the day of month. You can say day time hour is less than 10. And then we want to say is zero date time hour and else we say date time hour and one more time for the minute if date time dot minute is less than 10 we say date time dot minute with a leading zero and here without a leading zero so that's quite a bit of a pain especially if this pattern changes um so if you have frequently changing patterns in your app, I would really recommend to do this uh, platform specifically. So on iOS, you use a uh, date formatter, whatever they use for that, I'm not sure right now. And on Android, you can use the, the Java API, which you can also actually uh, convert this to. So there is a function to, um, actually not here. Um, yeah, because it's the shared module here, we only have the Kotlin version. But on Android, there will be um, like a two Java local date time function or so. Cool. So now we can actually return build string, which just allows us to construct our date string. Um, first of all, we want to append, what is it? Um, so a month name, a day, a year, and basically in the order that I mentioned here, append the month, we append a space, append the day, oops, we append a space again, we append the year. Here you want to append a comma and a space. We want to append the hour, append a colon, 
and append the minute. That's what we want to do and how we can construct this. And now we can also share this logic between iOS and Android. But at these things, you see that there's still a lot that can happen to make KMM better because that's, of course, a pain. We don't want to do this for all of our date formats, but we could actually still kind of share this. And this formatting logic is not really platform specific. But right now, there's just no pure Kotlin library that uh, fully supports this. Uh, other than this one, which does not support us right now. Anyways, the next thing we want to do is we want to set up our node data source. That is how we will actually read our nodes. We go to domain, since we just want to write an abstraction of that, which is just similar to a DAO object, which you get from a room database. So we just have a node data source, which will of course also be shared between Android and iOS. And here we specify all the functions we need to access our local database. First of all, that is a suspend function insert node. You're going to pass a node we want to insert. We have a suspend function get node by ID. Um, ID is a long, returns a nullable node. We have a function get all nodes, returns a list of uh, nodes. And here, um, normally with SQL Delight, you can also make this return a flow. So that flow will be triggered every single time there is a change in your database, which is of course very convenient. You might also know that from Room. However, you can use flows on iOS, but that requires a lot of extra setup since uh, iOS does not know curtains in the way Kotlin does, and you will need to um, specify extra dispatchers, an extra kind of flow data type. Maybe I, I'll make a, f a video about that in future, but for this simple app here, this would be a bit too overkill, I think. However, with coroutines, so just suspend functions, that's pretty easy to use in iOS since they will just be kind of compiled to a callback or we can also use uh, async await in iOS, I think. Um, but we will simply use a completion handler, which will be triggered when the suspend function finishes. So that's easy. That doesn't require any further setup. And as a last function, we want to have suspend function delete node by ID. Like this. So now we have our abstraction and we can write the implementation of this, which belongs in the data layer now. So a new package here called data. And by the way, if you are building a more complex app that has more features, I would not structure the package structure like this. Instead, I would have feature root modules um, just, to, just to tell you that, that you don't separate by layers in all of your projects. But in this simple example, we only have one feature. It would be overkill to make a feature module for just that single feature. So we're going to, we're going to go on with the data. And in that data package, we will create um, what will we create? A node package in which we write the implementation of our node data source. So in that node package, we create a class called uh, SQL delight node data source. So that's now um, an explicit implementation of this node data source interface, which tells us, hey, this one uses SQL delight. And we want to make this implement, um, not SQL, uh, node data source. And in here, we can also press control I to implement all these functions. And what we need is access to our database, which you can pass in the constructor. Whoops, what did I do? Um, we can simply say DB is a node database. And now you can see there is our generated node database, which was yeah, generated from SQL Delight, which we can then use to actually access that. We can access that using our queries which we get from that db object, so db.nodeQueries. And those are just um, a bunch of functions that were generated from our SQL file. So all these functions are now contained in that queries object, which we can now use here. It's very simple. So all we can do is we can say queries insert node and we pass all of our values. So node.id, node.title, node.content, node.color hex, and node.created. And we actually also need to convert this created here to a local datetime object. So we can say date time util to epoch millis because we want to save a timestamp in our DB and then we're good. And let's also add name parameters. Can we do this here? Add names. Ah, I want names for everything. No, that's a bit weird. I'm not sure when it actually tells me. Oh, okay. Cursor needs to be before that. So now we have names. I like to use name parameters in Kotlin. Makes things clearer. Also, if you have a pull request or so, then uh, people won't see your inline hints. 
So that's why I always use this, at least for functions where it's not obvious. Let's go on with get node by ID. We want to return queries, get node by ID. You can pass our ID and that will now return. What is that actually? Um, it returns a query of type node entity. So it's not a node yet. So what we want to do is we want to say, oh, come on, let's do it like this dot execute as one, which returns a node entity or we'll actually execute as one or null because it could be null if we pass an invalid ID. And then we can say that, so that's now um, a node entity, which we need to kind of map to our node domain model, which we don't have functionality for yet. So that's what we're going to do next. We want to create a node mapper in our data node package. Node mapper, very simple. And that's also a core concept of clean architecture that we have our, um, our data models, which in this case is just our node entity. So which just contains the fields we directly save in our database in the, yeah, in the way we save it in our database. For example, our timestamp is along there and not a local date time object. But since working with um, local date time in our case is a lot easier than with a long timestamp, we kind of map these to a domain model. And that also has the advantage that all of our app can now access this domain model and work with that because our other classes like the presentation layer should not know what kind of stuff we're using behind the scenes to save our data. So if it knows that we use a local database for our model and that changes, then our presentation layer would also change if we wouldn't have this domain model in between. Hope that makes sense. Let's actually just implement a simple mapper function called uh, yeah, extension function of node entity called to node. And here we just return a node object out of our entity. It's very simple in this case. We just set all the fields to what they are except for the created timestamp. because that will be a date time util um, to epoch. I actually don't know. This time it's different. This time I want to use instant a dot from epoch milliseconds because now we get a timestamp and we want to convert that to a local date time object. So our created long. And then we want to say to local date time passing our time zone. Very cool. Now we have our mapper and we can go back to our data source and say to node. And there we go. And that's our get node by ID function. Let's go to get all nodes. Also very easy. We can say queries dot get all nodes. This time we want to execute it as list. So we get a list of node entities and we want to map each item to a node. There we go. Now we have that and for delete, that's the easiest one, just the lead node by ID and passing our ID. And with that, we actually already have a working database. One more thing we want to do here for the, short, uh, for, the, for the shared module is we want to create a use case to search nodes because yeah, a use case contains business logic in clean architecture and it just does one single thing in our case, searching a list of nodes and returning the, the filtered results. And we can now use this yeah, to just define this business logic once in the shared in the common main module here. And then we can use this in both iOS and Android, which is awesome. So in domain node, let's have a use case search nodes. And all this will have is a function execute, which will get a list of nodes we want to search. And it will get a query. So the search term that we actually want to apply and it will then return a list of nodes again. So the filtered nodes. First of all, if our query is blank, we want to simply return the nodes as they are. So if the user does not enter anything, we just want to show all nodes. If not, then we want to return a nodes that filter. And now we need to think about some filter logic, which nodes we basically want to include and which not. So here we get a node. And we now need to return a Boolean expression whether we want to keep that node in the list or filter it out. And we can do this by saying it that title because we want to search for, uh, we want to take a look at the query and check which nodes actually contain that query in the title or in the content. So we can say that trim to just get rid of uh, leading and trailing spaces. We want to say that lowercase so that our search is not dependent on any um, capitalization or so. And then we want to say contains our query dot lowercase. 
So we just convert everything to lowercase so that we're sure that it matches um, the word and not the, the, yeah, the kind of way the user spelled it. Or if the content actually applies to that condition. So content trim lowercase contains query that lowercase. And yeah, there we go. We could also say we order this. So sorted by it dot actually by date time util two epoch millis. And here we pass our it dot created. So then it will simply order that by date so that the latest node will be on top. Let's make this on a separate line so it's a bit more readable. And yes, you could also create a separate use case for this um, to just sort the nodes, but I decide not to, to not make this too complex because this could be considered as a single responsibility violation because there are multiple reasons why this function could change. Uh, but I wouldn't be so strict with that if you have a simple project like this one here. Um, normally, I'm not even a fan of use cases because they just make things very complex in my experience, unless you work on really large code base. But one last thing we actually need to do in this shared module is we need to create a way that we can get a reference to this database on both platforms. Because as I mentioned at the beginning, we have different dependencies for iOS and Android. For iOS, we have this native driver. And for Android, we have this, uh, this Android driver. And this, of course, differs, but it's still kind of shared logic because it uses our shared database. And what we want to do is want to go to the data and create a new directory called local. And in here, I will create a database driver factory because the way SQL Delight works is it uh, works with these SQL drivers and each platform or in this case each platform has a different type of driver so for android we have an android driver for ios we have the native driver and we want to just create a factory here that's shared which can create the correct driver for the correct platform but since the construction of these drivers differs per platform we kind of need to make this class expect and if you're new to this that is a kmm keyword Expect basically tells us, hey, there needs to be an actual implementation of this driver of how we create one. So here, create driver, which returns an SQL driver. There needs to be an actual implementation of this function for both Android and iOS. So what we're going to do is we want to go to our Android main inside shared. And in here, we want to have our local package and create our... Um, database driver factory here. So we now have an implementation of this factory in Android and on iOS. And this time it will be an actual class. So that is the kind of part of this expect keyword. And now we basically specify the exact implementation just for Android because Android, what we need is actually the context. And that of course does not exist on iOS, which is why we put this in the Android main directory here and not in the shared one. So here we can say we have an actual function create driver returns an SQL driver. And here we now say this is how you create that driver for Android. And that is an Android SQLite driver. Here we have access to that since we included that dependency just for the Android main module. And this takes the schema, the context and the name. So we can say node data node database dot schema context is context and the name is no db and we still get a little issue here if we hover over this you can see it has no corresponding expected declaration why is that the case i am actually not sure because we do have this expect um, class here but we can actually also try to first implement this for ios because it should yeah i'm not sure Let, let's try to implement this for ios as well here in ios main here we use uh, we make a new local package as well and create our database driver factory in here as well. This will be an actual class, does not need a constructor here. And we have a function, an actual function, create driver, returns an SQL driver. And here we want to return the native SQLite driver, which only requires our schema and not the context database schema and the name is also no db and for some reason it does not want to recognize this actual this expect 
class. And I think the reason might be because I did not have a, a data package here. So let's say we create a new data package inside uh, Android main and inside data, we create a local one and we move in our database driver factory, refactor, uh, click continue. And does that now work? If we go to uh, local, yes, now the error is gone. Okay, it seems like you really need the same type of package structure. Then let's do the same for iOS. We create a data package slash local, move in our database driver factory, refactor, continue, get rid of the local one. And then we don't have any issues. Here's the iOS implementation. And this is just the shared one we can now use in our shared module. Very cool. Now that we have our shared module in place, I would say that we go on with Android. So now we write the Android specific implementation. So basically all the stuff that needs to be written natively for Android, which means the UI and the view models. So what I want to start with is the node list screen. So just the screen that displays all of our nodes from our database. And we're going to use the Android app module for that, which is now just as a normal Android project, nothing KMM specific in here. So we can just directly use everything we are used to. So here inside of this Android package, I will create another package called node underscore list for node list screen. And in here, we are going to create a class called node list state, which will reflect the UI state of our node list screen and here it is worth mentioning that you could also share this state logic using KMM so that you have this uh, node list state class on both iOS and Android. Yet for this project, I decided against that because I structured the architecture a little bit different on iOS. So we will also be using MVVM and view models and all that stuff. Just uh, yeah, that it's very similar to Android, but it's also totally reasonable to choose something else if you feel like that's an advantage. But in iOS, I actually choose separate fields in the view model. So I don't have a single state class as I use in Android here. Um, instead, I use single fields because I'm not uh, as familiar with iOS yet as I am with Android. And I just don't know yet all these uh, fancy operators to combine stuff and things like that. So I went with a safe approach. Okay, so what do we actually need in this node list state? Of course, we need our list of nodes. So let's reflect that. And you can see here, we now get our node domain model from our shared module. So that's working perfectly fine. Let's set that to an empty list by default. We then also want to have um, a search text, which is just the, the current text field value of what is in the search field. And we want to have a variable is search active. So just a Boolean, um, because if you remember in our search field, um, do I still have the iOS app open? Yes, here we can kind of toggle this field. We can make it active and inactive. And that is what this is search active Boolean refers to. Cool, so that's already it for our node list state. There is not more that we need to put in there, but now we need to create our view model. And that is another topic when it comes to KMM. Uh, can we share view models between iOS and Android? Because view models often contain quite a bit of state mapping code and uh, things like that. And yes, we can share view models. I'm not very deep into that yet. Uh, maybe in the next course I use this, but here for this app, I actually create separate view models, which makes things a bit easier, but we need to write more code. And also a shared view model only really makes sense if we then use something like state flow. And we also share this state state flow logic so that we have something uh, shared we can directly observe in iOS and we have something shared we can directly observe in Android. And as I mentioned with flows in KMM it works but it's a bit tricky and needs for the setup. We need custom dispatchers for iOS, a custom flow type and I think that would just make this a simple starter guide here too complex which is why I decided to show that in a later video. So let's just create individual view models for each platform. Here we want to have a node list view model in our node list package. And this will be just, as we know from Android, inheriting from view model. We're going to use Hilt for dependency injection. And that is maybe another topic that is <laughs> worth talking about. Uh, what do we actually use for dependency injection? Well, I already mentioned when I pasted the dependencies that we use Hilt. But Hilt, as you probably know, is a Java specific dependency. So we can't use Hilt on iOS or in the shared module, which we luckily don't have to. So the thing is these automated compile time injected dependency injection frameworks 
aren't really a thing on iOS. So on iOS, we rather just go with the manual approach of just using constructor injection and creating the um, our or objects that we want to inject wherever we want to kind of scope them. So if we just want to scope them to a specific screen in iOS, which is called a view, then we can just create that in a view, for example, a view model. So we can create a view model directly in the view. And then if the view is destroyed, then the view model is also destroyed. So that is how we scope in iOS. And if you want to make things a singleton, we can just declare these dependencies at the application class. So we have a similar application class in iOS as we do in Android. And we can just yeah create our very own dependencies there and simply pass them down the um, yeah dependency tree or the, the constructors. Meanwhile, on Android, we have things like uh, these custom view models here from uh, the Jetpack library. So that makes it a bit harder to inject stuff because we need view model factories. It's just Android. So here we really want to use Hild. We can easily inject safe state handle. Um, so that makes things easier. And luckily KMM is set up in a way that we can say, hey, for Android use Hild and for iOS, we just do this on our own. Some people might wonder why I'm not using Coin here, which is a pure Kotlin uh, dependency injection library. And you can use that with KMM. And the only advantage of Coin over Dagger Hill for KMM projects is that you can also use Coin to inject stuff in the shared module. So if you have a class inside this common main module, for example, and here you want to perform the injection. So for example, you want to inject this database driver factory into some kind of other class. Then you can do this with Coin. With Hill, that doesn't work because Hilt uh, does not work in this common main module. However, you don't really need to be able to inject dependencies directly in common main, at least with a DI library. So in here, we can also just do normal constructor injection. We don't need to define any inject annotations or so. Um, so as you have seen here, effectively here, we perform dependency injection since we injected our database into our data source. And that works perfectly fine with any language, with any framework. We don't need a library for that. And especially when it comes to Jetpack Compose, <clears throat> as for now, Coin is pretty trash in my opinion. Um, so it has its issues with injecting safe state handle. There's only a deprecated function that actually provides a safe state handle. And in the current version, it does not provide us with the navigation arguments in safe state handle if we want to use these in a view model. So we're going to go with Hilt and we will actually benefit from that. So in here, we want to have an inject constructor as usual, import inject. And what kind of dependencies do we now need in this node list view model? We, of course, need um, our data source or node data source. This one here coming from our shared module. And we want safe state handle, as I said. On the one hand, to actually get navigation arguments. So just if we, and that's not relevant for this screen, but if we then later navigate to the node detail screen, this safe state handle will contain the node ID we actually navigate it to. So if we click on a node, we pass the node ID to the next screen to, so we can load the node there. And this will be uh, contained in the safe state handle. For this screen, safe state handle will be useful to just set up our app to survive process death. So if the Android system decides to kill your app, the user goes back, we can use safe state handle to restore our state because the normal view model state would be lost in that case. So in here, I will first of all create a reference of our use case of our search nodes use case. We can actually directly create that in here as it does not require any parameters. If it would require our data source, for example, I would also uh, provide it with Hilt or so and inject it. But this is so simple, we can directly create it here to make this a bit simpler. And now we need states. So first of all, we want to have a list of nodes. And I will kind of recover all these or get these from our saved state handle. Um, in this case, it's probably quite optional if you make the support process death because there is no really critical data that could be lost if the app is killed. Because if the user goes back, the nodes will be reloaded from the local DB anyways. But I still want to show you how I would do this. So we can say save state handle, get state flow. So we directly get a state flow. When something in that safe state handle changes, this state flow will emit a value. We give this a name of nodes and the initial value is a list. Yeah, an empty list of note. Just like that. Then we want to have another value from safe set handle, which is our search text. Get state flow, search text, initial value is an empty string. And we're going to have is search active, which is our Boolean, whether the search is active or not. 
like this, and the initial value is false, uh, false so we can uh, keep this untoggled. And you might also wonder why I make these separate fields here and uh, not directly have one state here coming from safe state handle uh, that gives us a node list state that would work if we would make this a parcelable, um, which would not be an issue. We could do that, but I kind of prefer this approach because it's, it makes it a bit, a bit easier which values we actually restore from process death and which we don't. Because not always we want to restore every single value. Imagine you have some kind of remote music service API you are talking to and you have a, a Boolean state whether you are connected to that API currently or not to play music, then that would be for example a state you would not want to restore. Because if the app is killed and the user goes back, but the user was previously connected to that API, then if they go back, they are of course not connected anymore. But if you would get that from safe state handle, then you would kind of restore that connected value, which you don't want if you're not connected. So in that case, you just want to reset it to the default value. Just to give you an example that not always you want to restore all values coming from safe state handle. But in this case, we do want that. And if you just get a single state class here from safe state handle, uh, that's harder to actually decide which values to restore and which we don't want to restore. In this case, we can still easily construct our node list state out of these three state flows by using the flow combine operator. So we can say we have a val state. And by the way, all these can be private. Private, private, private. And our single state we expose here will be equal to combine. And we pass all of our different states here. And we then get references to these. I also recently made a video explaining how uh, this combine works in detail. But we then get references to these and this block will now fire every single time any of these state flows emits a value. So if we change any of these, we want to recalculate our node list state. So we can say node <clears throat> list state. The nodes aren't directly our nodes here because we want to apply our search to these because it could be that the user searches. So we can say search nodes execute, we pass our list of nodes, and we pass our search text. So whenever now our nodes or search text changes, we will re-execute our search nodes uh, use case to reflect the latest state. And if the nodes list or if the search text is empty, we just get all of our nodes. Um, and then we have our search text, which we can simply pass and a search active as well. And right now this wouldn't do anything because we did not launch this flow or kind of put it in the state flow. Because right now, if you take a look, that's just a normal flow and not a state flow, which we want. So what we can do is after this, we can say state in to convert this to a state flow, which will always cache the latest value. And this will also, by the way, only emit a value. So this resulting state flow if the result of combine changes. So combine, this command block here might be fired a lot more than the state flow will emit values later on. So here we want to cache this in view model scope, sharing started um, while subscribed. So in here, we could also pass a little bit of a, a stop out timeout milliseconds. So for example, on a screen rotation, we would then not actually resubscribe to this state instance instead only if the user actually navigated uh, out of the app for more than five seconds. So while subscribe just means, hey, this block is going to be executed only if there are active subscribers to this resulting state flow. And finally, the initial value is just an empty node list state or the default one. Cool, now we have our state and we can get to our functions we wanna have here. First of all, we want to have a function to load our nodes. Very simple, we just execute a curtain in view model scope and here we say, okay, our saved state handle at nodes, that's where we save our nodes list, is now equal to our node data source get all nodes. And that is already it for this function. So we just update the value in saved state handle, which will allow us to restore it after process death. And since we update that here, this state flow will fire, which will then trigger this combine block because one of these three values changed and we will recalculate our node list state, which we save in the state flow. And we then simply observe this in our Compose UI later on. Then what else do we need? We want to have a function on search text change. When we type something, then we also just update the value in safe state handle in search text and just set it to text. We wanna have a function um, toggle 
search, actually on toggle search, I will call it. And this will just toggle the search. So safe state handle is search active is now equal to, yeah, just the value negated is search active that value. We also want to check if is search active is now false, then we also want to reset our search text. So search text is just an empty string. Because if we kind of untoggle our search, um, let me open that here. If the search is active, and we type something here, and we then go to uh, we click this little x, then we want to reset the search text because otherwise, it would still kind of show the filtered notes, which a user probably wouldn't expect if, uh, if they closed the search. And one last thing we want to do here is we want to have a function to delete a note by ID. Pass the ID here, we launch a curtain in view model scope. And we say a node data source, delete node by ID, pass our ID. And we also need to reload the nodes, um, actually load nodes. Normally, we wouldn't need to do this if we would actually get a flow from our uh, SQL delight database, because then it would directly trigger if it changes, which it does here. But uh, since we choose the easier approach here of not using flows, we need to manually call uh, load nodes again on our API. Cool. That is it for this node list view model. And the next thing we want to do is we want to go to node list or package, and I'll start building the actual UI in Compose. So here we're going to create a new class, which will be called hideable text field which will simply be our text field we can uh, we can use to search and we can use to yeah toggle and untoggle the search. So that will be a hideable text field with a bunch of parameters. On the one hand, we have our actual search text we want to have is search active. Maybe we should call this search text field to just make sure it's used for search. Hideable search text field. Select all. Okay. Yeah. Is search active is a Boolean, we want to be able to pass on text change, which is simply a listener when the text changes. We want on search click. When we click on the search icon, we want to have on close click. When we click on the close icon to close the search, and we want to have a modifier that we are able to pass here from compose UI is equal to the default modifier. Oops. So in here, how will this look like? That will be a quite simple view, we're going to have a box, passing our modifier, and then going inside of this block. And just to give this a little bit of an, of an animation, we can use an animated visibility here, since yeah, our search field is actually toggled and untoggled. And whenever that visibility of it changes, we will perform a little animation. The visible condition, so whether we show this or not, is is search active. Um, we want to set the enter animation or the enter transition simply to fade in and the exit transition to fade out. And in here we will put the content what we want to animate. This will be an outlined text field in this case. Ooh, outlined text field in this case. The value will be our text. On value change will be on value change or on text change. Um, let's put that on different lines. We want to have a shape here to make this a little bit rounded. Um, we're going to say rounded corner shape and we give this yeah something like 50 dp or so. So we just have a round shape. Let's give it a placeholder of search which is just the hint. And we want to be able to pass a modifier, which is a modifier that fill max with padding 16 dp. And I want to apply some additional end padding. Um, just because here, um, if this is active, we don't want the search field go to the very end of this. So we could also solve this a little bit differently. But um, you know, Android, we only have one uh, one icon button actually. So I will apply some end padding of 40 dp. And now what's missing is our icon or actually our two icons depending on what is visible and what not. So what we can do is below our animated visibility, we're going to have two more animated visibilities. 
The condition is the same. This time we again say is search active. Because if the search is active, we want to show our close icon to close the search. Um, or enter is fade in again. Exit is fade out. And in here, we're just going to have an icon button. On click is on close click in this case. Where we're going to use an icon. Image vector is icons default close. So just an X. And let's choose close search as the content description. Mm. Put that on separate lines. And we actually also want to align this at the end of our box. So we can say modifier is modifier align center end. Let's copy this for our other icon, which is now negated. So if the search is not active, we want to show this, which is then our search icon to kind of show the search again. Here we also want to keep this stuff the same. This will be on search click instead. And this will be a search icon. And here we can say open search, something like that. And that is already our text field. We can then easily show in our UI. The next thing I want to do is I want to create the node item. So each individual node, which you can see here. So basically this colorful thing in our nodeless package, node item, select file, composable node item. This will need the node on a display, of course. This will need a background color, compose color. It will need on node click, just a listener. It needs on delete click. And it needs a modifier, so we can change it a bit. Cool, so how will this look like? First of all, I want to store the formatted date here in a variable, which we get from our um, date time util class in our shared module to just format the date to display it here. I want to say val formatted date is equal to remember, since we don't want to execute this on every single recomposition, instead only if the node created date actually changes. And here we can say date time util, which comes from our shared module, format node date, and the date time is node.created. So how will we structure this? In the end, we're going to use a column here with a background. In the column, there will be a row for the title and this close icon. Then there will be a simple text and another simple text. So nothing very special. So we have a column. We assign um, a modifier modifier.clip, clipping that to rounded corner shape of 5 dp radius. I want to say background is our background color. Clickable, then we say on node click. And some padding of 16 dp. Cool. So, as I said, first of all, the row, where we say the horizontal arrangement is space uh, between, because we want to push this title to the very left and this icon to the very right. Want to make sure that we center these vertically. And want to make sure that we fill the whole width of our parent. Then in here, in this row, text, which is the title of our note. Uh, the font weight is uh, font weight see my bold and we're going to use a font size of 20 sp and i uh, intentionally decided against using uh, theme resources here to just not make this uh, even more complex and below this we're going to use an icon the image vector will be icons default um, close again so about little x and i intentionally also don't choose an icon button here because an icon button occupies so much space and that looked a bit weird if um all the stuff would be pushed down a little bit because this button needs more space. The content description is delete node. And since this way the ripple effect when we click on this button looks very ugly because it's just a square around the icon, um, I want to disable that. So we can say modifier, modifier.clickable. And here we can say we customize this. We want to pass a mutable interaction source, which we just have to pass. And the indication is just null which is the ripple effect. And when we click, we trigger on delete click. Cool. And then below our row here, 
We're now going to add our remaining two texts, separated by a spacer, giving it a height of 16 dp. First of all, the text for the node content and setting the font weight to light. Another spacer, 16 dp. And this time we're going to have the text for the formatted date. I want to make the color um, to uh, color dark gray to just make this a bit less prominent. And we want to set a modifier of modifier align um, and we align this at the end. Okay, let's put this on separate lines like this. And that's already our node. So now the last thing for our node list screen is the actual screen. So in node list, in our package, we're gonna create a new class, a new file, node list screen, select file, composable node list screen. This will take a reference to our view model, node list view model equal to hilt view model, just usual compose stuff here. The state we will get from the view model by view model state, collect as state, import that. So we just transform our state flow into compose state, which I always do. We wanna have a launched effect block where we pass true for the key in which we want to load our nodes. So this will be executed as soon as this screen composes. So when it uh, composes for the very first time, and I'm not going to call this in the init block of the view model because uh, if we later go to our detail screen and we go back, we want to reload our nodes. And since the screen will be recomposed in that case, or kind of recreated, this will fire again to reload our nodes, but the init block of our view model would not reload in this case. So for this screen, we wanna have a scaffold since we use a floating action button. In here, we can simply pass this floating action button on click what happens here actually nothing yet because then we want to navigate to the detail screen but i want to choose black as the background color like this and in here we can choose an icon and the icon is icon default no, not that one icons default add content description is add node like this and let's also set the tint to white. In here we get some padding from the scaffold in case uh, it changes its size or yeah, it, it just wants to apply some padding to its child views or composables. So we can say column. In here we want to apply a modifier of modifier fill max size. And we apply that padding. And now the next thing we want to create is um, this section here, since we want to display this all notes text above our search field, if this is not active. So we can go in here, say, okay, we have our hideable search text field. First of all, the text is state at search text, is active is state at is search active. On text change will be view model on search text change. On search click is view model on toggle search and on close click will be the same. For the modifier, I want to say that's equal to modifier or the fire dot fill max width and we apply a height of 90 dp, which I just experimented with a little bit. Then below this, so or rather above this, since this should actually be a box and not a column, um, so we can display our all notes text above this search text field. We're gonna say animated visibility. The is visible condition in this case is state is search active if that's actually false because if the search is not active anymore, we want to show our um, all notes text. Enter is fade in again. Exit is fade out again. And we pass text here. The text is all notes and we make it a little bit larger. Um, whoops. I want to say font weight is bold and font size is 30 SP. Like this. And uh, this should actually also be aligned in the center. Um, so we can just apply this to our box, content alignment center. There we go. 
Now we have that section. Um, let's go below our box. Where is that? Here. Well, we just want to show a lazy column for all of our nodes. The modifier of this will be modifier weight 1f, which will just achieve, um, let's import this, which will achieve, oh, come on, why doesn't that work? Is it this one? Yeah. Um, I don't know why it gives me that error. None of the following can be applied, but we are in this, are we in this column? Oh no, I actually wanted to put all this in a column. That is making sense now. <laughs> um, because outside of the column, we don't have access to weight, of course. So I actually want to create a column here where I apply the modifier. We apply it here for the box. And for the box, we just say modifier fill max width. Then we can put in the box in here. And now we also get a little error here of animated visibility because we need to refer to a column. So to the scope of the column, so we can say this at column dot animated visibility. Um, I'm not sure why it complains here, but it seems like it needs a clear reference to a column for this animated visibility. And then below, we can take this lazy column, put it in here, and then the error is gone. Um, so the reason why we apply a weight here of 1f is just to occupy the remaining space. So we just occupied some space for this search bar and with modifier uh, weight 1f, we just say, okay, this list now occupies all the remaining space because we didn't assign any other weights. In here, we can say items, import this list items here. For each node in our nodes list, we now wanna show our node item. The node is just node, the background color is color, so compose color, create that here with a hex value and the hex value is node color hex. And on node click in here, we want to actually navigate later. We don't have that logic yet. And on node uh, uh, delete click, we say view model on, or actually delete node by ID. And we need to make this an actual Lambda. So view model, delete node by ID, and we pass our node ID, which is theoretically nullable, but we can assert it's not null here because if we have a node item in our list, we know it's it's not null, it can't be null. It's only null if we insert a node, then we specify with that null value, hey, SQL delight, please generate a node ID for us. And we can apply a modifier here. Uh, modifier is equal to modifier fill max width Fill max width, padding of 16 dp. And we can say animate item placement to just make sure that we animate changes in our list. So just a simple animation. For that, we also need to pass a key. So we have unique identifiers for each node and the list actually knows what to update and what to animate. The key is simply the ID of our node. So it.id and assert this is not null again. And we can also add this experimental annotation here for nodeless screen. Cool. Um, seems like we have one more issue here. Okay, just a broken import. Now that we have our nodeless screen, we can actually start to try out our app. Before that, we need to set up Dagger Hill very quickly. So what will we do? We will go to Android, create a DI package. And in that, we're going to create an app module oh, like this. Select object, make this a module and install it in Singleton component. And here we are just going to provide the database driver on the one hand and on the other hand, our, uh, I mean, we need to provide the node data source for, yeah, so we can inject it in the view model. Provides singleton and if this st stuff is new to you then uh, please just watch my dagger healed guide on youtube which will clarify all your doubts in here we're going to have a provide function for the sql driver we need the context so the application class returns an sql driver and here we return our um, database driver factory pass in our app mm, no 
dot create driver. Oh, I missed that here. Okay, now the error is gone and we're going to have one more function which will provide our no data source. In here, we will then inject our driver and we're going to return a no data source. So we can say, okay, we have our SQL delight node data source where we pass instance of our node data base actually. And here we pass the driver. That's how we create an instance of our database. Of course, if you have multiple data sources of the same database, I would also provide this database instance here. So it doesn't get recreated every time you create one of these data sources. But here we only have one, so it's fine to do that. Next up, we need to set up our application class to set up Dagger Hilt. So in Android, we create a new class, node app, in, uh, annotate that with Hilt Android app, make it an application like this. And then simply um, going to manifest and specify this here. So the name is node app. And last thing for DI is just going to main activity here. Yeah, let's just get rid of this theme because we're not going to use this. Um, or let's not care about this. Let's just, let's just leave it as it is. We delete all this, annotate main activity with Android entry point to be able to inject view models in this activity. And for now, we just pass our node list screen here. Let's try this out. The first time we launch our app here, and that will probably take a little moment. So we can see if our shared logic is actually working fine, at least for Android for now. And I will see you back when Gradle is finished building. And there we go. Our app is launching, which is great. Can we toggle the search here? Yes, we can. There is a little animation here for everything. That is very cool. Um, we, of course, can't see nodes yet, but we could insert a sample node into our database in node list view model. So here in init, we could say um, view model scope dot launch node data source insert node, and we pass some kind of sample node. Or we could also pass multiple nodes. Let's say um, we have a loop here, and we can say for each. we insert a node and the node is just, um, the ID is null, the title, title is something like node it, so with our current index, content is content it, the color hex is, yeah, let's just keep it at one, one hex here. So we just have one color and create it is, um, date time util that now let's launch this take a look at our uh, emulator and there are our notes so everything seems to look exactly as we want right now we of course can't click on these at least nothing happens um, that's what we're going to work on next on the detail screen also here for this floating action button but that is already looking quite cool then yeah next up we're going to create the detail screen and then the ios ui so let's go on with that and remove this init block first of all so i want to create a node underscore detail package in our android package and in that one we first of all again want to start with uh, creating the state just as we did for the node list uh, feature and uh, then we will follow that up with creating the node detail view model and then the actual ui in compose so node detail state, make that a data class. Here we're going to need to store a reference to the node title. So just the node title text field, which is empty by default. We want to have a state whether the node title text is focused, is node title text focused, because we will store, uh, we will show a hint. Initially, yeah, initially that's actually, no, it's not focused, of course. We have the node content as a text. Is node content text focused? And we want to store the node color as a state. And by default, let's just choose color white. And then next up, we want to create our node detail view model in our node detail package. Node detail view model. Make that a view model as usual. 
hilt view model and we inject, oops, inject a constructor using hilt like this. We need a reference to our node data source again so we can load the node from our database and we need a reference to save state handle so we can also set this up to survive process death but also here for this screen as I mentioned before we want to be able to retrieve the ID that we pass as a navigation argument from the node list screen to the node detail screen and we can use save state handle to get a reference to that ID so we know what to load and here I will do um, the same approach as before we are just going to have a bunch of private states on the one hand the node title which we get from save state handle get state flow and again, I want to stress out that you don't have to do it like this, um, that you have all these separate fields and then you combine them. Of course, that gets a little bit messy if your state gets larger. For this state, it's okay. Um, but you can also store the state as a parcel level. But again, make sure that you only store what you want to store in safe state handle. Um, and then you need to worry about that instead. So note title empty string we can duplicate this five times i think we have five fields in our state we have is node title text focused well, let's get rid of this text is no title focused that should be enough paste this here that is false by default this is node content this is um is node content focused Put this in here also set it to false uh, this one is node color uh, safe state handle get state flow this is node color as well and the default one here we need to save that as a long since uh, we can save compose colors in state flow uh, in safe state handle so we want to say the default is just we can just set it to zero which would be black let's choose white like this and then we have our typical combiner again, which is our state, um, which would be combine. And here we combine all these different flows. Um, is a node title, node content, is node content focused, and node color. So if either of these changes, this block here will be executed. So title um, is title focused, content is content focused, and color. And we construct a node detail state out of that. So note title is note, it's just title here, is no title focused, is is title focused, note content is it's just content oops is node content focused is content focused and the node color is just color i'm um, actually a compose color here um so we could do color and wrap this color here but let's Let's keep this view model compose free so we don't uh, include any compose dependencies here and just say we have a color here go to no detail state and make this along instead as well. We can then set it to our white again and then we can just wrap this around a color in our UI. So this way it does not work because record along found an int then let's make this along instead so then we can also uh, support transparent values um, and yeah just the alpha value so just append two f's here and we are good and then the next thing will be an additional state flow which we uh, don't want to include in safe state handle which will be has node been saved and that will just be used to uh, navigate away after we save the node Mutable state flow, that's false, of course. And we have a public version of that just so that the UI can change this value, which it shouldn't. And of course, we also want to launch this flow, which I totally forgot and actually save it in a state flow. So we can say state in just as before, sharing started while subscribed, pass something like five seconds here. And we say no detail state as the default state. Cool. Next up, I want to store something in a variable called existing node ID. 
which is a nullable long and null by default. So if we actually navigate to a node that exists, then we of course want to load this node and we want to just keep a reference to the node of it because if we then update that node, then we want to pass this existing node ID again. So we update the node instead of inserting a new one. Then here in the init block, when we create this view model, we can say safe state handle at the key of node ID and let's actually say dot get since we want to pass uh, the information that this is along like this. I want to check if that exists. If it does, then we know this is our existing node ID. And we can say, okay, our this existing node ID is equal to the existing node ID we got from safe state handle. But we also want to load the existing node in this case. So we can say we model scope launch node data source get node by ID. We pass our existing node ID check if that exists, we get the node here, and then we can just update our state using safe state handle. Um, this will be the node title, is node title, um, safe state handle at node content will be a node content, we don't need the comma here. And one more time for the node color will be node color hex. Just like that. So that will already be enough to load our node if we clicked on an existing node. So we show the data and we can update it. But if we want to create a new node, then this will simply be null here and this block will never be called. And I just noticed something we need an additional check here. If that existing node ID is minus 1L, we want to return. And the reason for that is that the navigation library of Compose does not support nullable primitive data types and long is a primitive data type. So we need to pass minus one if we actually click on the add node button because then we don't have a node ID. So we, can, we somehow need to detect an invalid node ID. And if that's the case, then we just return and we don't execute this piece of code. So this will actually always be executed, but this only if there is a node that exists. Now we need a bunch of functions to just uh, make sure to update our values like the title, content, color, um, if we if, if there are some actions coming from the UI. So on node title changed. Oopala. String. Here we update safe state handle, node title to text. We can copy this. I think we need four of these functions. One, two, three. This will be for on node content changed. Replace this with content on node title focus changed. Here we pass whether we are focused or not Boolean like this. Here we say uh, is I better copy this <laughs> is node title focused is equal to is focused. And here we just say on Note content focus changed is focused and we say is focused for um, is note content focused. I actually want to change one thing. That's now a no detail state. I want to rename this and this to is note title hint display instead um, or visible because that is a difference. Um, we don't all only want to consider the condition whether this text field is focused or not to show or hide the hint, but also if it's empty. And we can uh, better just map the, the value to that in the view model. Uh, you will see what I mean. Um, so we can again hit Shift F6 here to also rename this one. Is not content hint visible. This won't change anything in the view model. Just in our combined block, we want to consider whether the title is focused to determine if we want to show the hint or not, but also that our title is actually empty. So only if the title field is, is empty and it's focused, we don't want to show the hint. So we don't want to show the hint if it's not focused. And the same here for the content. So if the content is empty and the content is not focused, then we want to show the hint. That now makes sense. Cool. As a last thing for this view model is that we want to be able to save and update a node. So down here, 
function save node. We launch a coroutine in view model scope and we say data source, uh, no data source, insert node, which will simply insert a new node or replace the existing one if the ID exists. So we can say node, the ID is our existing node ID. The title is um, actually node title value. The content is node content value. Um, and then we need the color hex, that's node color that value. And created is date time util dot now. So we just, yeah, if we just update the node, then uh, the created field will also be updated to just uh, yeah, reflect the latest date. And after this suspend function here has been executed, we want to, uh, oops, we want to set has node been saved to true. So then we will observe on that change in the UI and just uh, pop the back stack. And one thing I just noticed that we should change is this initial value of our color, which should actually not be uh, white. It should be a random color because if we click on this plus icon to add a new node, then we want to just assign a random color to this node, which will just be nearly created. And if we load an existing node, then the node color will be updated here at this place with the node color that oh, yeah, we just saved in the database. So instead of this, we want to say node.generateRandomColor. And then we are good for this view model. The next step will then be to create the transparent edit text that I mentioned so that we can create a text field that is transparent with a hint because by default the basic text field in Compose does not support hints. And then we can create the actual screen that displays our note. So uh, for the transparent hint added text, uh, we want to put that here in no detail. Um, transparent hint text field, let's call it like that. And that will actually be very simple. So we're just going to create a uh, com composable here. Transparent hint text field like this. And it will need a bunch of parameters. On the one hand, the text that is just displayed on that uh, text field. And then we want the hint, of course. We want the modifier, just usual compose stuff here. We have a Boolean, whether the hint is visible or not. Initially, oh, let's set it to true initially. Let's actually not make this um, have a default value. Let's pass this from the outside or let's force to pass this from the outside because we want to do that anyways. Let's be able to pass a text style since we want to be able to um, change the size of the font inside of this edit text to make it bigger for the title and smaller for the content. Let's be able to pay, uh, pass a single line attribute, a boolean, false by default and what else on focus changed. Because we of course need to listen to this focus state of this text field to be able to also properly hide the hint when it's unfocused. And this will essentially just be a box with a normal basic text field. And then we overlay a little text if the hint is visible. That's really everything that happens here. So modifier in here, we have a basic text field. The value will be our text and on value change will be something I missed here on value. Well, let's put it above the modifier on value change. Changed gives us a string, returns nothing, and we can pass it here. Well, let's put this on separate lines because we need a bit more. We want to set the single line attribute to our single line. We want to take uh, set the text style to our text style. And we want to attach a modifier, which is modifier fill max width and on focus changed. So when this gets focused, we get the focus state here. And we simply want to say on focus changed with our new state. So we can then decide about what we do with this outside of this text field. Cool. So that's just a normal text field right now. What we now want to add here is below this, we want to have an if check. If the hint is visible, we simply display a little text with our hint. Text style is the same as our text style. I think it's just called style and the color. Let's set it to something like dark gray. You could also make this, um, you could also pass this as a parameter, of course. 
like this. And that's already our transparent hint text field, which we can now use in our no detail screen. So let's create that here. No detail screen, make it a file, composable, no detail screen. And this takes the node ID as a parameter, which is actually not null because um, these navigation arguments can't be null if it's a primitive data type, as I said. And we want to have a view model reference, no detail view model, it's hilt view model. In here, we first of all want to listen to the state we get from the view model. So again, val state by view model. Oops, view model, come on, uh, view model dot state dot collect as state. Import that. And we also want to listen to has node been saved. Also by view model has node been saved collect as state. And when that changes, this has node been saved, which you can listen to in a launch defect block. Then we launch um, this block of code here. We can check if the node has been saved. And if so, here we don't have a nav controller yet, but we can add a to-do statement um, to simply navigate up or rather pop the back stack like this. So below this, we want to have a scaffold again because there will also be a floating action button to save the node. And for this, we can actually just copy uh, the scaffold from our other screen from the node list screen because it's a bit similar. So we can copy this bunch of code here to our node details screen instead of this scaffold. And then we can get rid of the content here. Um, we can keep the column. Just get rid of the box inside this on the lazy column. And for the floating action button, let's adjust this a bit. Here we want to set the on click to view model, save note. This will be save note. And let's have a little check to, yeah, just save the note. Cool. Then for this column, inside of this column, we actually only have two text fields, our transparent hint added text fields. And here before that, I actually want to also add a background, which is our node color actually, state node color. And here we need to convert that to a compose color. So you can wrap this here. And let's also add some padding on top of this of 16 dp. Cool. So in here, as I said, we're going to have a transparent hint text field. The text will be state node title. The hint will be enter a title. Is hint visible? Is state, is node title hint visible? On value change is view model on node title changed. On focus changed is here we actually open a lambda block because we want to say view model on node uh, on node title focus changed and we can pass it is focused. And the title text should be single line. So we can say single line is true for this and the text style will be text style with a font size of 20 SP like this. Then we can copy this. We can add a little bit of space in between. So normal spacer with a height of 16 dp. We can then, oops, paste what we copied before. This one will be for the node content. We can say enter some content. Here we can say is node content visible. On node content changed. On node content focus changed. And single line will be false for this one, since we want to be able to enter content over multiple lines. Cool. That should be it for the screen. Oh no, actually one more thing, and that is a modifier here. Of simply 1F. So we assign a weight of 1F, so that this text field just occupies the remaining space. Cool. So that's already our screen for the node detail. Mm. What is now missing is the navigation. So we need to set up navigation between our list screen and our detail screen, which we can do here in main activity. We can simply do this with a nav host. So nav host, give this a nav controller here, which we can get with remember nav controller. Don't need any parameters, we can pass it here. Don't want to have a graph, but we want to have a start destination, which will be node list. And then in here, we specify our different screens using this composable function. The route will be node list in this case. We don't have any arguments. And in here, we just have our node list screen. 
This one is simple. The other one requires um, an argument, which makes it a bit more complex. Oops. So we have a composable. The route is node underscore detail in this case. The arguments are a list of nav argument. The name will be our node ID. And then we can configure that argument. So the type is um, a nav type dot long type. And the default value will be a minus one L. So with that, we just make sure that if we don't pass this, um, then we just get the default value. And in the node detail view model, this piece of code here would then be triggered. So we don't actually load the node if we pass an ID of minus one. Then inside here, the com inside of the composable block, we get a reference to the nav backstack entry, which contains information about the arguments that were passed. You can say backstack entry. We can get the node ID using the backstack entry. So dot arguments dot, what is it? Get along. We want to get the long with the key in node ID. And if that's null, we again assign minus one as a default. And then we can say no detail screen, pass our node ID. And we also want to pass the nav controller reference, which we don't have as an argument there yet. We also want this here for the node list screen, by the way. Nav controller is nav controller. So let's go in here in the node list screen. Pass this here so we can navigate. Um, where do we want to navigate? Well, if we cl click on our floating action button, of course. So here we want to say nav controller navigate. We want to navigate to the node detail screen. And by the way, I missed something there for the road. Um, we also need to specify the arguments here after this slash. Here we would then simply pass minus one L. So in this case, if we click on adding a new node, we want to not have any, any ID that we pass. So we just pass the invalid ID that we just are able to create a new node and don't load an existing one. Then if we scroll down where we can click on a node here, there we want to actually also call nav control and navigate this time with node detail. And here we pass the ID of that corresponding node we clicked on. Cool. So let's go back to main activity because in here for the node detail, we also need to add this argument in this style to this route so that it knows which argument we specify in the route actually corresponds to which one of this list. And one last thing in the node detail screen, we also need a nav controller. Let's open this. Have the nav controller in here. And then here we, where we have our to do statement, we can say nav controller pop back stack. And this should hopefully be everything for the Android app. I would say we launch this and try this out. So here is my device. We should still be able to see these nodes. And then we can also check if we can actually properly search. We could have checked that before already, but let's now check everything in one go. And there we go. Here is our list of nodes, which is nothing new to you yet. Let's try the search. If we search for node one, yes, then we get node one and node 10. You also just saw the little animation again here. Yeah, these animations that we implemented with our lazy column. And if we now add a new node, click this button, then yes, we get to the new screen. Let's try if the random color generation works. Yes, that works. Let's add a title. Let's say this is a new node. Let's add some content. Hello world. And we click add node scroll down and there's our new node. So that is working perfectly fine. Yes, the date is overlapped a little bit by the floating action button. You could add some bottom padding here to avoid that. And I think right now we also don't have any condition in the uh, no detail screen that prevents us to insert a node into the database that has an empty title because I think that should work. Um, but I think you should be able to do that as a homework at home. Um, that's just a very little change before inserting a node to display some kind of error message. Feel free to extend this. That's actually a good practice as well. Um, but let's also try to delete a node. Clicking this little X. That is working perfectly fine. We can hopefully click on a node. We can edit it. Node 3 updated. Content, blah, blah, blah. 
click check and yes that was updated so it seems like our android app is working fine one little change that you might want to do is that if you edit this then the floating action button is currently overlapped by the keyboard we can change this by going to the manifest here of our app going to activity and say soft windows soft input mode and setting it to adjust resize if we then relaunch this then we should be able to see that the floating action button is actually moved up with the keyboard together as you can see so that's a bit better we can then directly use this here to update our node cool so that is working perfectly fine with our different colors here does it only know two colors no <laughs> here's a third one here's another one so what's missing now is of course the ios app which is what we will do next i will keep the structure similar to android not exactly the same because ios has its own mechanisms to do that uh, but we already got one app in place here and we're now going to work on the other one so as i already said we can't build the ios ui in android studio we need to use xcode for that and for that you need a mac because xcode only runs on a mac and we will now be using swift and swift ui for building the ui so complete context switch here but i will explain everything i do and it's actually quite similar to um, kotlin and compose so swift will just be the equivalent to kotlin which is the programming language and swift ui is the ui framework of apple at least the latest one and that compares to jetpack compose so i do have xcode open here uh, but that is uh, the project that i prepared we actually want to open our existing project that was generated during uh, the creation of our kmm project so what we want to do is we want to go to file open or if you just opened xcode in a new window so you don't have a project open yet then there will be a button to open an existing project which you need to click we click open and now we need to select the iOS app folder of our KMM project to actually open this here. And I want to go to Android Studio for that. Go to iOS app, our directory, right click, open in Finder. And then this is the directory here of my KMM app. And if we then open Xcode, or is it here? Open the Finder window again. We can simply drag in this iOS app directory here so we can directly open this and we just get the path of that. We want to select this Xcode project file, click open. There we go. Here we have our KMM app open, um, at least the iOS part of that. We see on the left, we also have a package structure. We have our iOS app class and our content view, which is the initial view. We don't have this greeting here, so we can get rid of that, which comes from the shared code section. So we don't need this. We still want to import shared. It says no such module shared. Um, let's try to run this. Usually the error then goes away. And of course, <laughs> we should also remove this greet here before. We can just replace it with hello world. Run this again. But the shared module seems to be found now. Build succeeded. That looks good. My emulator is opening up. And here's our hello world iOS app. So we can launch our iOS app. That was super simple. Again, if you use CocoaPods, which I mentioned at the beginning as a dependency um, managing framework here for iOS, then uh, you need to do some more configuration here in Xcode. But since we didn't use that, it's super simple. And we can directly just launch our app here on uh, the iPhone simulator. That is what we will use from now on. And we will start... Yeah, just the way we also started with the Android UI by creating our view models. Also the, the node list view model, which we will then use in the node list screen. This will be a little bit different than on Android. So we won't be creating the exact same views or yeah, there are just some differences, of course, for, for this platform. And before we start with this, I also want to kind of highlight that uh, I am also rather new to iOS. Um, so if there is something or if some experienced iOS developers are watching here uh, and there is something that is not super perfect or something that's not super the best practice, then uh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> it's just because I'm rather new. Everything I do here is well researched and I can explain everything I do. I understand this, but maybe there are some internal mechanisms you only know if you do iOS for years, then um, I can't consider that here. So please have some mercy for that. So first of all, I want to go to our iOS app directory and in here create um, a new group. Um, iOS calls these packages in Android groups. So we say new group. We call this node underscore list. And in there, we're going to create a new file, which will be a Swift file. So here we use a Swift file for just normal classes like our view model. And then we're going to use a Swift UI view. 
if we actually want to make yeah, a view for our user interface, something like a composable in Android. So we can click next and we can call this node list view model. Click create and there we go. Here's our new file. And the first thing I wanna do is we wanna create an extension um, for node list screen. Let's actually first of all create this node list screen view. So whenever I say view here in iOS, it's basically yeah the equivalent to a composable. We're going to go to node list and create a file called, this time it's a Swift UI view here, since we build a view, a composable. Um, and this will be called node list screen. And I will explain what I do here. Like this, we don't need to change anything here. But in here, this extension is similar to the extension functions we know from Kotlin. So what we can essentially do in Swift with these extensions is we can say that the view model we now create here, the node, detail, uh, node list view model, is actually only be able to be created inside of this node list screen. So this code can only be used inside the node list screen, which is what we want in the end, because we kind of define the relationship between these two classes, or in, in this case, this view. So we can say this view model belongs to this screen. And in Swift or in iOS, we don't have this view model um, parent class as we as we have an Android, so we can say view model. Instead, what we say in Swift is we have an observable object. So that's just a more complex object that hosts yeah, some kind of state variables, which the UI can then observe. So whenever there is a change in these states, then the UI will, notify, will be notified about that, similar as compose state. And we also, in addition, want to annotate this class with add main actor. This will make sure that all the code inside of this class will be executed on the main thread, because yeah, in the end, this view model deals a lot with updating state and directly updating the UI. So we should add this annotation here. So how do we now say that this node list view model actually needs a reference to our node data source? So in the end, how do we define a constructor in Swift? If we say private var node data source, node data source, um, we don't find this here because we need to import the shared module in Swift or in Xcode. I don't think there is a, like an auto import as we know in Android but we also need to import much less than on Android. So here we can just say import shared, then it should also recognize this node data source here, which comes from our Kotlin code now. And we set this to nil by default. So that's the equivalent to null in Kotlin. And then how we define the constructor is with a simple init block. So we also have this just like in Kotlin. And here we say no data source equal to nil by default. And then we yeah, just assign that to the local variable of this node list view model. And there is a reason why I choose nil as the default as the default value here. Um, and I will explain this later when we get to our UI, to our node list screen, because right now I think that would be a bit too much and some new concepts that I need to explain here, but I will explain that later when we get to the UI. So don't worry about this. And I will actually also provide a function here that allows us to update this node data source later to assign a value that is not nil. So what we can do is we can say we have a function set node data source and here we pass an instance that's simply not null and then we can say self no data source is no data source and again yeah i will explain why we have this and this when we get to building the ui so here in swift how do we actually define the states in our view model so we want to have a state for our nodes list we want to have a state in this case actually also for our filtered nodes so after we search for nodes in iOS, we actually need to cache these before so we can show them again if we um, yeah, kind of remove what we remove the text field content of the search bar. And that we don't need that because we have a safe state handle, but here we don't. Then we need a state for the search text and we need a state for whether the search is active. Let's start with our state for the list of nodes. Actually, that doesn't need to be a state that updates the UI since we will be using the filtered nodes for that, but we need to cache these nodes by saying that as a private var. Again, in Swift, it's similar as in Kotlin. A var is a changeable value. A let is a, yeah, a constant value. Then we want to choose a var here so we can assign this later on. Nodes is equal to a list. That's how we define a list in Swift. And we call the constructor on that. A little bit weird if you know that from Kotlin, but yeah. We just say with these uh, brackets here that it's a list, that's a type of the list, and that's that we want to create a new list. And then we want to have um, actually not a private var, we just want to have a var for our filtered nodes, which is actually 
equal to our, no, we can't set, uh, assign the nodes yet. Let's also just make this a list of node by default. And on Android, you know that if we use a compose state in a view model, then we have this private set. So that only the view model is allowed to change the value of this uh, state. And in iOS, we can also actually do the same. So we can say we actually have a private set var, which means the property is publicly readable. So the screen later on can read these filtered nodes, but it can't set these. So it can't assign a new value, which is what we make sure with this private set. And one more thing, right now, the UI would not be notified about changes of this field. How do we achieve that? We achieve that with the so-called published annotation. So this will basically, yeah, just mark this field as kind of a state in this um, observable object. And the UI will then be notified if that changes so it knows how to recompose or how to redraw itself. So then the next property we have here is another published property for our search text. So again, private set, or actually in this case, not a private set, why I will explain later, um, search text and that's just an empty text by default. One thing we want to do here is we want to say did um, in curly brackets afterwards, we want to say did set, which is executed after the value of this property has been uh, set. Because when that happens, we want to filter our nodes. So whenever our search text value changes, we want to execute our search nodes use case to update the value of this state. So we can say up here, private let search nodes is just our search nodes use case. And after the search text has been set, we can say self filtered nodes is equal to search nodes dot execute. And here we can pass our list of nodes. So our nodes would be self dot nodes. And the query would be our search text. And with that, we make sure that we always properly update our filtered nodes. And this list is just responsible for caching the loaded list of nodes once so that we always have the um, that we always search in all the nodes when the search text changes and we don't consider the, the already filtered nodes for the search. And one last thing here in terms of state is a published property private set var and that is for our is search active boolean. Initially that's false. So what do we want to start with here in this class in terms of functionality? Let's first of all write a function that allows us to load our nodes from our database. Load nodes, and in here we now want to use our node data source dot um, get all nodes. And you can see since get all nodes is a suspend function in Kotlin, and we now have yeah somehow the Swift representation of that. We on the one hand get this um, get all nodes function here that was generated, which gives us a completion handler which in the end is just a callback that gives us a list of nodes and an error. And that's just called when the suspend function finished executing. On the other side, we do get this get all nodes function like this. And you can see that's an async. Um, so that's pretty much the same type of behavior in Swift that we have async await. Um, but I decide to use this completion handler callback API here because I'm not very deep into this async await yet but likely for the next video uh, regarding KMM, I will then use these. If you're familiar with that, feel free to use that instead. So we will use get all nodes. And here we get, as you can see, a node, a node list, I mean, and an error. So how do we get these values? It's very similar as in Kotlin. We can say nodes and error. And instead of the error in Kotlin, here we say in, actually in, and then new line. So when the suspend function finished, we can say, the self nodes is equal to the nodes list here. Since that can be null, um, that's just the way it's generated. We want to assign um, an empty list if it is, oops, like this. So here, this operator is just the same as the um, question mark colon operator in Kotlin. And we also want to say self filtered nodes is equal to the nodes here, or let's say self nodes. And then next up, we want to have a function to delete a node by ID. The ID is an int 64 here, which is the Swift equivalent of a long in Kotlin. We want to actually be able to make this nullable and simply check if the ID is not nil, uh, not like that, we're not in Python. <laughs> um, if the ID is not nil, and you can see we, we don't use parentheses here for the if statement, but the rest is the same. Then we want to say no data source, um, 
delete node by ID. Here we pass our ID. And um, I don't think Swift has a, co a concept of null safety. So even though we have this null check here and there is no way the ID would not be, uh, would be null in this case, we still kind of need to add this null assertion here, which is yeah, just a double exclamation mark in Kotlin. Here we just use one exclamation mark. Completion handler would give us an error again, but uh, we don't care about that. So we can simply say self.load nodes because when the deletion was successful, we want to just reload our nodes because yeah, one node was actually removed. Next, we want to have a function to toggle our search. Let's call it toggle is search active. So you can say self dot is search active is um, self dot is search active. So we just is search active. So we just toggle this. And we also want to check if self um, dot is search active, if that's false, then we want to reset our search text just as an Android. So we just add that to an empty string. And we actually don't need all these selves here, by the way, because we only deal with the single local variable. That's a bit cleaner, I think. And that's our view model. Um, it's very similar as an Android, just that we yeah, just use some different ways here to specify what is a state and yeah, but in the end the functions are the same and as I said, you can use shared view models in KMM, then you don't have to re-specify all this stuff, but yeah, that just adds some initial setup complexity when it comes to flows and all that kind of stuff. So now that we have our nodeless view model, let's create the first Swift UI view here, which will reflect our search bar. So in our nodeless package, we create a new file, Swift UI view, click next and call that, um, let's also call it hideable search text field, like that. And this is now how such a view looks like. So we basically have a struct um, that is a view and each view needs to implement this body view, which is again, yeah, basically just what we write in a composable function. And here this looks very, very much like compose. We also get a preview, which also is very similar as compose. So yeah, here we just have the default preview. On the right, you can see the preview was paused. If we click render here or retry, then we should be able to actually see a preview here. And the good thing about iOS is that it's actually live. So if we change something here, um, hello YouTube, then you will directly, no, you won't directly see that. Um, can I preview this file? Why not? Let's click here, launch error, reached update limit. I have no idea. Let's retry this. Now it updated that. Let's try again if it's a live update. If I swap this out to hello world again. No, it seems like my preview is broken. Um, yeah, so much to iOS preview is a lot better than Android one. I will probably just relaunch my Xcode here and uh, hope that will solve it. So I am back, my preview seems to work again. So if I change this to YouTube, you can see it just updates in live, which is pretty cool. Let's uh, not leave this at hello world though. Instead, let's remove this view and we instead want to build our search text field. So let's first of all, think about what kind of parameters we actually need in this um, search text field. So what do we want to be able to pass from the outside and yeah, just do here. On the one hand, we just want to have a, a var on search changed just as in Kotlin to get, uh, not a unit here, it's a void to get a reference to the new text. Here it's a string. Um, and here in the struct, by the way, we don't need this init block as in a class to define constructor parameters. They are just, yeah, whatever we put in here. So that will be a parameter we pass from the outside to this view. And then we want to have a destination provider, which will be returning a destination. And uh, yeah, the way we basically want to pass a view to this view, um, because what we want to specify here is when we click on this little plus icon, which will be on in the toolbar on iOS. On Android, we have that as a floating action button, which is not a thing on iOS. So we put it in the toolbar and we kind of want to specify from the outside where we navigate when we click on this plus button. We could also completely make this action uh, custom, but I will, I will just keep it simple here. And we do this by specifying yeah, some kind of generic here, um, which you call destination, which is a view. And that way, yeah, we are able to specify a destination that we pass here. And then we know that when we click on this plus button, then we navigate to this destination. So to our different screen in this case. 
We want to have a variable is search active, which is a boolean. Here it's just a bool. And we have a var search text, which is a string. And this search text will actually be a binding. What is a binding in Swift? Uh, or rather Swift UI. It's similar as we know in, um, in JPEG Compose, if we create a text field, and then we essentially create a so-called two-way binding. So we actually assign a value to the text field, the text, which reflects yeah, just what the, what the text of the text field shows. And on the other hand, we get a lambda that tells us when the text changes. And in that lambda, we update our text, which then again reflects as the state of the text field. And in Swift, we just have this binding annotation, which, which just uh, does both of that in one variable. So if we pass this to um, a view in Swift, then the view is allowed to change this value, even though this is not in the local scope of the view. So you will see how this works. In here, we basically want to have a row on the one hand of our search text field, then of two boo icons. And a row in Swift UI is an H stack. So a horizontal stack, just like that. And in here, we want to have a text field which we first of all um, need to specify a hint for. So here it's very easy. We don't need this. Um, we also don't need this transparent hint field for the detail screen. So here we can just say search. That's the hint. And you can see we're missing an argument for parameter text and call. So we need to specify that here. The text is dollar search text. So this dollar operator is kind of needed if we want to say, hey, we actually want to pass this binding instance. And that's exactly what this text field expects here. We don't see this in the preview yet because the preview is broken. We need to pass some values here. So what we can do is we can say on search changed is just an empty lambda. We don't need that in the preview destination provider. Here we can just also have a lambda with an empty view and is search active. Let's set that to true. So we actually um, we actually see the search bar and to create a binding here for the search text, we can just create a constant by saying that constant and passing something like hello world. That will just be the content of the text field. And here we actually need to return an empty string, I think. Oh no, we actually get a string here. So value in like that, but then we can leave it empty. And if we leave this, Sadly, there is no default formatter here for iOS, I think, or Xcode rather. If we leave this, then do we already see something here? Um, it definitely pushed our hello world text to the left. And, and that is now the hello world text of, uh, of our text field. So if we change this to YouTube, then you can see that also changes here. We can uh, click in that and we can edit it. Uh, we can't edit it because we use a constant binding here, uh, but you can see it's actually a text field. Now we can very easily edit this here with some so-called modifiers, as we know from Compose, just that we don't pass these modifiers as a parameter. Instead, we just say text field, blah, 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 dot. And now we can apply these modifiers. For example, text field style, and we can set this to dot rounded border. And you can see it just got a border and we can also say the opacity, so the, the alpha value that would be, is search active. If that is true, we want to set it to one and else to null. So there is this operator we can use. Uh, I think it's called the ternary operator. So if this value is true, we assign 100% opacity and else 0%. We don't want to make this completely invisible because then, yeah, the H stack will shrink down and kind of move our icons into the middle, which we don't want. So with this, we just hide the view, with, uh, but it still occupies space, which is similar to visibility invisible in Android. Well, that's actually rather just to um, make this text field always occupy the height of our kind of toolbar so that if it's removed, our icons won't shrink down in height, which would look a bit ugly. We can make sure that it does not shrink down in width by saying if is search active is false, then we want to add a spacer. And that's these spacers in Swift UI are a bit different from you know, the spacers we know in Android, because if we just use a spacer here, then this basically means occupy all the space you get in our H stack in this case. So if we then attach some icons and the search is inactive, then instead of the text field, 
we will basically just have um, a spacer that occupies all the remaining space. And then for our two buttons, we want to have the search button and the, um, the add button to add a node. We can simply say that's a button. So similar as an icon button in Android, the action is on search. Actually, do we have an action on search toggled? Actually, this here should be on search toggled. I just saw on search toggled and we don't need this parameter um, because that's exactly what this binding does. It allows us to pass this down to the text field and the text field can then change this search text value. So we don't need to kind of provide a way like an Android that we um, host this state up to whatever uses this hideable search text field and then kind of passes this search text field state down again. No, th this binding can actually do both. So this text field view can directly change the search text, which is why we don't need to provide a lambda when the search text changed. But we want a on search text, uh, on search toggle function, which you can uh, simply pass here. So we know what to do when we click this icon button. And to uh, provide an icon here, we can say that's an image. We want this overload here with a system name. In iOS, we can simply provide a little name with the icon. There are a bunch of lists online with all the icon names you, you can think of. This one is actually called a magnifying glass for this search icon. And we actually want to kind of have a conditional here because we only want to show the search icon if the search is not active. So I want to check if is search active. If it is, we show um, another one instead which is called X mark, just the um, little X symbol, and else we show the magnifying glass. And if we now fix our preview here by changing this to on toggle, on search toggled, then we can get, over, get rid of all that, change this to an empty lambda. And then if we wait a little moment, we see this little X symbol here in our preview, which we can then use to close the search. Cool. So uh, below that, we want to have another button, which is now uh, related to navigation. So we're going to use something called a navigation link and the navigation in Swift is a bit unintuitive for Android developers at least. So we don't have a nav controller that we pass around that we can use to say nav controller, do this, go there and stuff like that. No, we actually have these navigation links, which are kind of views, as you can see, and that's a bit unintuitive, I think. So if we click on that, we can say we go to a specific destination, which is in this case, our destination provider we passed. So we can simply pass this from the outside. And we then include some content, which in this case is just an image with a system name again. And this system name is plus. So we just show our add button. And you can see there it is. Um, the preview actually looks a bit weird here. Um, so it doesn't look gray in if we actually launch the app, but here for some reason it does but that does not matter. So that's it for our hideable search text field. I hope you got an okay impression at least um, of how it works to build UI in Swift UI. Let's uh, build the next UI component, which is our node item. Right click, new file, Swift UI view, and we make this a node item like this. And there we go again, we again get a preview. And in here, we are going to first of all, um, provide the arguments a node item needs. That's of course, the node itself, um, we need to import our shared module, import shared, then we get our node. And we want to have a lambda on delete click. Um, like this, then we can adjust our preview to see what we're doing. Here we can say, node is here, yeah, we can create some sample node that we display here. The ID, you can see now uh, that is a little bit of a side effect of KMM. Um, the ID is a Kotlin long here and not a Swift long. So we kind of need to uh, convert these by saying, um, can we say Kotlin long? Yes, with value. I think we need to say long, long. <laughs> I don't know. Um, let's set this to, I don't know, one. We can actually just leave it at nil because we don't need the ID here. Um, the title would be my note. Content would be note content. Color hex would be 0x um, ff. Let's just choose something here. I don't know what that is. And the created timestamp will be our date util class. Um, and here in KMM, we actually need to create an instance of that. So it's not um, as easy to use companion objects here as in Kotlin. But then we can say that now. And we need to provide the next parameter, which is on delete click, which is just an empty lambda. Cool. So let's 
create our node item view. Just as an Android, that will simply be a column and um, a row for the very first item. So we have a column here, which is a V stack, a vertical stack. And we want to also specify alignment, which is a horizontal alignment that works a bit different here than uh, on Compose. In Compose, we can also set vertical um, alignment or arrangement for columns. In Swift, we can't. We do this with these spacers, which I mentioned before. But here I want to say that's leading because I think stuff is centered by default here. And yeah, leading just refers to the left, so the start. Then in here, we want to add a text with the node title. You can see that reflects in the UI as well on the left. We want to modify that a little bit to make it a bit bigger. We can set the font here to a title font and I will set it to title three to have a good size for the title. And we can say the font weight is that semi bold to make it a bit bold. Then we want to have a button to delete the note. So we say button um, action on delete click. And here we get, again use an image with a system name in this case. Yeah, again, X mark to have a little X button. And you can already see um, this is now arranged vertically. Of course, we want the first row. Um, uh, yeah, the first element of the column to be a row which is again an H stack in Swift UI. So we can say H stack and simply put this stuff in there. Like this, you can see now the icon appears on the right of our text, but we of course want that the um, node text is pushed to the left and the icon is pushed to the right, which I mentioned we achieve with spacers by simply saying we have a spacer here and you can see now it basically pushes both items to the corresponding edges. And I want to make the icon color black. So we can say that foreground color is black. And to also have some spacing below this H stack, because now we want to insert the content of, our, of the node, we can add a little bit of padding here. And we do this with dot bottom. And we can assign a value of three here, for example. Um, so we say we set the bottom padding to three. If we would leave away the three, it would apply the default padding of iOS, which would be a little bit too much for my taste. So I'll leave it at this. So then in here, we now want to put the note content. Note.content, there you go. You can see the, cont the, the content text here. Let's assign a font weight of light. And we wanna add padding as well to also add some padding to the date string that we form it. So that will be bottom three again. And here we're going to have our date text. So note created and that is our local date time. You can see it's a Kotlin X date time, local date time. Um, we just want to display our formatted string so we can say date time util format node date time and that will be node.created. I will set the font here to footnote. So it's very small and I will set the um, font weight to light. You can see currently it sticks to the start of our column. How can we achieve it to be at the end? Again, we're going to use a spacer. So we make it an H stack here, a horizontal stack, put this in there. And we basically just put a spacer on top like this, and then it's pushed to the end. And now what's missing is of course the color and the background of this node item. So how do we achieve that? We can achieve that again with a modifier just as in Jetpack Compose that is applied to this outer V stack. So right here, no, this one. First of all, apply some default padding. You can see that everything is pushed in the middle a, bit, a little bit. <laughs> um, we want to assign a background. And here we need to, of course, assign a Swift UI color. However, we only get longs. And a dumb thing about Swift UI is that they don't support longs by default. So we can simply say color um, and create that here with a hex code that we simply pass that we have here from the node. So node.color hex. That doesn't work. There is no such overload, which is why we need to create that on our own if we want to share colors um, using KMM. That is not a lot of code, but it's code you wouldn't directly get to. So I also got that from the internet. We can simply go to our iOS app, create a new file, Swift file, click next, and we call this colors. In here, we want to import Swift UI. Actually, yeah, import that. And then I will just paste some code here. I don't want to type this off. It's just a function that uh, creates an extension to color. So we just kind of uh, creates another 
constructor for this color type that I mentioned before, which allows us to just, yeah, pass a hex in form of an int 64, which is a long in Swift. And then it does some bit shifting and things like that to yeah, just provide a way to use a color that comes from a long, which is, I think, something that definitely belongs in the standard library. Um, I don't want to include this on my own as a, as a user of Swift, but it is how it is. Let's leave it and now we should be able to see that we don't have an error here. And you can see that our node has a beautiful red color, which I randomly typed here. One last thing is rounded corners. So we can say clip shape, similar as the clip, uh, the clip modifier in Compose, um, just that it clips after applying the background here. Mm, here we can say it's a rounded rectangle and the corner radius is five in my case, uh, not corner size, I want corner radius, like this. And you can see now there are a little bit of uh, rounded corners, which looks quite cool. And that's our node item for Swift UI. Very cool. Next up, we want to create our node list screen, which you already have the struct for. So in here, for that, we again, first of all, need to think about which parameters we need in this view. On the one hand, that's of course our data source private var node data source. Um, we need the shared module again, import shared. And here we have a node data source. Um, so that's a bit different from Android. In Android, we just inject all of our stuff in uh, our view model. In iOS, we don't have these inject annotations. So we just pass these things to the view. And in the view directly, we initialize our view model, just like a normal constructor. We don't have any factories or so. Then it's also bound to the lifetime of this uh, screen, which is what we want. And then to actually get a reference to our view model, we can say a var view model is equal to a node view model node list view model, where we pass our node data source. Um, we don't have that yet here. So we just pass nil here. And now it comes to explaining what I mentioned before, what I will explain, uh, why we actually made this nullable and why we have a function to assign a node data source to this view model. And the reason is in Swift UI, uh, let me go back. In Swift UI, when we initialize this view model in the constructor of this node list screen, which we could do, we could have an init block and in there initialize the, the view model. And then the issue is that the init block can be called multiple times in Swift UI when this uh, view is actually, I, th I think when it recomposes or when it is redrawn, um, then we would reinitialize the view model, which is not what we want. We want one instance that is shared across all instances of our node list screen. And what we can use for that to achieve this behavior in Swift UI is we can annotate this with add state object. And what this basically achieves is exactly what I just mentioned, that we have one instance of, of a view model for our node list screen. And that way it's not kind of um, reinitialized in the init block. The disadvantage is that we don't directly need to provide this instance here which um, here we don't have this node data source yet because that's only initialized in the constructor of our node list screen. And this code is called before the constructor. So here we don't know there's no data source yet, but to be able to still provide a valid data source to the view model, we have this function to set this later um, in a function when our view is actually visible. Hope that got clear. So let me show you what I mean. We have our init block here with um, our node data source that we pass from the outside, which is a singleton. And here we just say self node data source is a node data source. And then here for our body, we are going to have a V stack. And after this V stack, we're going to have a modifier called on appear, which is called well, when this view is drawn on the UI. And if that's the case, we want to say view model um, set node data source and we pass our node data source because at this point we know which what this node data source is because then the init block was already called and the value from the outside was assigned properly. And the first thing we want to set up here in this vStack is our search bar. Uh, and in here we're going to use a Z stack, which is the equivalent of a box in Swift UI. So we can stack items in uh, yeah, in the Z direction on the Z axis. So we can yeah, just uh, draw one item above another. And that is what we want with our all nodes text. We're going to draw that above our search bar if the search bar is not visible at least. So in here we can start with a um, hideable search text field with all of our values. On search toggled would simply be view model 
on search or toggle search, toggle is search active, then the destination provider will simply return um, a view here. We want to navigate to when we click on this plus icon. We don't have this yet, which will be our no detail screen. So let's leave this blank for now. Is search active is view model that is search active. And the search text, you can see we need to pass a binding here, is a dollar view model search text. So with this dollar again, we refer to the binding. And I really hate how Swift arranges this stuff or how Xcode does that. And that there's no auto format shortcut. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are plugins to install, but I don't have that yet. Let's, yeah, I can't even indent this properly. <laughs> Let's not care about this. I will leave it as it was, like this. And we also want to make sure that this hideable search text field actually occupies the whole width of our screen, which we can achieve with the so-called frame modifier in Swift. We can say the max width is equal to dot infinity. So we just occupy all the width and the min height on the other hand is set to 40. So we just give it a fixed height. And you can see we still get an error here because if we remember the hideable search text field takes um, a generic argument, which is our destination type. Let's for now um, choose an empty view here since we don't have our no detail screen yet, which we would normally pass. And in here in the destination provider, we can then return this empty view. Just for now, we will change this later. And we want to apply some default padding like this. Our preview is currently broken because we don't have a no data source for it. And I think I'll leave it here. Um, you could also use the actual no data source, by the way, for the preview. Uh, but yeah, let's just build the UI. And then after that, we will launch the app anyways. So we'll, we'll be fine. We now want to make sure that if the view model is search active, if that's false, we want to show our all nodes text. So text, all nodes, and we apply a font of title two. Oops, title two, like that. And that is already our toolbar here. And I'm sure you can also use the official toolbar of um, iOS to include the search in there, but I want to keep it simple here. And I'm also not deep enough into how you can do all this toolbar navigation, customization stuff. So I just created my custom one as a normal view. Then below this Z stack here, we want to have a list, which yeah, is just the equivalent to a lazy column. And in this list, we will actually show all of our nodes coming from the view model. We achieve this with a for each loop where we want to, uh, which we want to execute for every single node in our filtered nodes list. And we need to pass an ID here so which is the the key, which in the end is the, the ID of our node, so that this list knows when to update what, which is similar to something like diffutil or so, or in Compose, we actually also assign the key. And this is equivalent to or equal to uh, backslash dot node dot ID. That's how we specify this, not node ID, actually self ID. So that's how we say that we refer to the item to the item type of this list and then to its ID. And then we can actually open this. Oops, come on. Like this, we get a reference to the node in our list. And now for each single node, we want to in the end display our node item. And to make it clickable, we just wrap it into a button. So action will be this. And the content of this button will be our node item. The node will be node and what else? I hate that I can't show the parameters here of this function, like control P in IntelliJ IDs. Note item, let's do this. Note and on delete click is, what do we want to do here? We want to simply say view model, uh, delete note by ID and we pass note dot ID. And we will probably get an error here, yes, because it expects um, an int 64, but we passed a Kotlin long again, because of this compatibility issue. So we need to say um, dot int 64 value to convert that. Cool. And here for this list, we want to add a modifier on appear, because when this list appears, what do we want to do? We want to load our nodes, of course. So we want to save your model dot load nodes. And that's how we do this in Swift UI. We can also set the list style to plain because normally Swift puts these items into little boxes, which we don't want here. So we set the list style to plain and 
we can set the list row separator to hidden. So we don't get separators. You can see we get a warning here that is only available in iOS 15 or newer. How can we set this iOS version here to at least 15? That's not an as big issue here in iOS if we increase this minimum supported version as it is on Android because on iOS each device or most of the latest devices get the latest version as well. And on Android we have so many different manufacturers where that's always a bit tricky. Um, which is why we usually support something like API 21 in Android. In iOS, um, I have at least, uh, I was told by iOS engineers uh, that uh, it's a good idea to support the latest uh, two, or the last two versions of iOS. So we can go to the info. Um, no, it is actually this iOS app to get to the build settings, um, at least to yeah, the general settings of this. And here we have minimum deployments, which we can set to 15. So scrolling up to 15.0 and then we should get rid of this error that we, since we yeah, support the minimum version here. Yes, now it's gone. And one last thing, what is actually missing here for this page? Um, we want to be able to navigate to the note details screen. When we click on a note, how do we achieve that? Because we again need a navigation link for that, but this time we want to click on a note, which is actually not a navigation link. And we want to also pass the ID we clicked on as an argument to the note details screen. And the way we achieve this is again with a navigation link, but we can pass this outside of this list. So we don't need to wrap every single note item into a navigation link, which we could do, but then we would get a very ugly arrow because the navigation link is a view, which I still don't get. Um, and that kind of includes that default arrow. I don't know why but we can uh, kind of bypass this by putting it, for example, in the Z stack and making it invisible, which is a navigation link here. And there is this is active Boolean here, which you can kind of use to make this, well, active or inactive. And when we then change this is active Boolean state, then we can say now perform the navigation. And that is how this works, or that's one way how this could work. And we want to create these two fields here as a state directly in the screen by annotating them with a state, which is just an annotation to make a local state, just in compose that would be a mutable state of. In a composable directly, var is node selected. And we can actually also make this private. And that's false by default. So that will be triggered or toggled to true when we clicked on a node. And we have a state, a private var is, I know, selected node ID, I mean which uh, holds the ID of the selected nodes we clicked on. And I'm using these local states here and don't put these in the view model because otherwise I always got a weird warning in the view model, which I didn't fully understand. You can try putting that in the view model, it will work, but uh, you will get a warning in Xcode. And to get rid of that is, um, yeah, we, we can simply use these as local states here. And we need to make this nullable here. Cool, so now that we have these two variables, we want to um, set these here in the button action when we click on a node. So we want to say is node select is not true when we clicked on a node. And the selected node ID in this case would be node ID. Um, and we probably need to say question mark int. Oh no, that's actually already um, the actual ID that we want. And then here for the navigation link, we can say we want this uh, destination that is active. We don't, uh, we can actually for the title, we can leave this blank. The destination will be our node detail screen. Let's quickly create that. So in iOS app, right click new group, node underscore detail. And in that we create a new file, Swift UI view, and next node detail view, uh, node detail screen. And we pass some parameters here. On the one hand, a private var, no data source again, no data source like this, import shared. And we want to be able to pass a node ID. So private var node ID in 64 and nil by default. And then we will keep the rest untouched for now until we get to building the UI for that, just that we can now create a reference of that in our node list screen. So here for the destination, we pass a node detail screen with um, constructor arguments that we actually also need to provide here in the init block. So 
Let's go back to no details screen, say we have a no data source. Okay, it already automatically generates this, um, just like here. So now we can go back to node list screen. Here we now need to provide some uh, values. And I again hate Xcode detail screen. This one here with <laughs> no data source is self node data source. And the node ID in this case is selected node ID. Then is active is our uh, state here. So our dollar selected node ID. Um, actually, is node selected uh, is node selected like that and we still get an issue here missing argument yeah because we need to open a block of code here afterwards since the navigation link needs to contain some content here we don't want it to contain content we can just make it an empty view and call the hidden modifier on it that was my kind of hacky way to achieve this i'm not sure if it is a hacky way or if, the, if it's the official way it works if there are some people who are really good at iOS, tell me how it's uh, how you how I could do it better. I'm not sure, but that one works, and I I think it's pretty dumb that you, how you achieve this simple thing of just navigating to another screen with a navigation argument. But let's just go on. Here we we get an issue. Oh yeah, it is this issue that I mentioned that we need to convert the card along to need to say dot int 64 value. And yeah, that's it for our screen here. That's it for our screen. Um, for the preview, let's just pass an empty view instead to uh, so that it doesn't break our code. So how do we now create the screen? Let's first of all try this out before we go on to the detailed screen. We of course need our node data source for that. And since we don't use something like Dagger Healed here on iOS, how do we get this? And for that, we need to make a little adjustment in Android Studio. Let's reopen this and go to our iOS main module. And the way we will do this is we will create our custom module in here in iOS main, where we just kind of host our singleton node data source. So in here, we're going to have um, a DI package. And in this DI package, we're going to have a database module, just a class. And in here, we will simply on the one hand have a private val factory, which we can say by lazy, which is just our database driver factory which we need to construct our node data source. And then we can say we have a private val um, node data source by lazy. That is an SQL delight node data source. And here we need to provide the DB, which is a node database with our factory that create driver like this. So it's similar as our dagger hill provides function, just that we don't use dagger hill here import node database and then we are good let's also specify that this is actually a node data source so or abstraction type and then we're good we can now uh, use this in ios as well by going to xcode again and here we want to rebuild this because whenever you change something in the shared module and you go to xcode you need to rebuild your project so that it reflects the changes you can rebuild with command b and then we can go to ios app which um, is basically the entry point of our application and here it just contains that content view right now however we want it to contain our node list screen where we need to pass our data source of course and in here, whatever we declare in this application class, just as an Android, we make that effectively a singleton. So we can say um, private let database module is equal to a database um, module. And we need to import shared here. Import shared. And now with this, we can basically just say the node data source is database module dot node data source like this. And hopefully we don't get any more issues here. Value of type database module has no member, no data source. Why not? Um, let's go back to Android Studio. Yes, because I made that private. Let's make that public instead. Go back to Xcode, rebuild. And then we should be able to see that the error goes away. Build succeeded. That looks good. So what if we now actually insert some nodes in our node list view model, just to see that this is working here in init. We can say no data source, or actually not here. We want to do this after we assign this no data source here, after we know it's not null. Insert node, and we can say we just insert a sample node. The ID is a Kotlin long with a long, long, or just a value of, ah, 
let's just make it nil again. The title is, um, what's the title? Note title, note content, color hex is something random again. Created is date time util dot now and completion handler. Here we get an error in something. We just don't want to do anything here. If we launch this in my simulator, then uh, that always takes a little moment. Let's see if that works. And yes, okay, it seems like it actually uses the same database as I use on my app that I prepared because I called it the same. Um, okay, so that works a bit different than on Android. On Android, it would actually be a new app, but here it replaced the existing app, but it works perfectly fine. And we can, yeah, we have our node in here. And one thing I just noticed is you can see we get an, an issue here, navigation link presenting a value must appear inside a navigation content based navigation view. And that's similar as an app host in Android. So we can place our, um, we need to place our navigation links inside of a navigation view in Swift, which we can simply we put in our body here. So in the view group, we can say navigation view like this and put this in here like this and if we now relaunch the app then we should not get this uh, this issue anymore there we go no the issue is gone and now our icon on, in the top is also um, not a gray anymore so we can actually also color these icons in black which i think would look better so in the hideable search text field for our two images we can say foreground oh come on foreground color is black and here as well like this Cool, so now we have our node list screen already in iOS. And the very last thing for this video, for this very long video, is to build the node detail screen, which is a bit easier, luckily. So the first thing for the node detail screen we're gonna create is the view model. For that, we actually only have the screen and the view model. We don't need any additional view for that. So right click, a new file, make that a Swift file instead. Click next and call it node detail view model. Like this. Make sure to import shared. Make this an extension of node detail screen. And in here we are going to have our class node detail view model. Make this an observable object again. Make sure to annotate this with that main actor just as the other view model. Nothing new here. And also what's not new is that we have a private var for the node data source. Um, node data source nullable. We have a private var node ID which is an in 64, which is null by default. So if we navigate to the screen and there is already a node ID, so if we click on a node and then we want to show it here, or we want to load it. And then we have three published properties here, which are effectively state on the one hand, the node title, um, var node title. And since these are effectively bindings here in Swift, we don't want to make these private set since we directly assign these to our text fields. So that will be an empty string. We will have another published var for the node content like this. And we can make a published, this time a private set var for the node color. And we can set this to node dot um, companion because that uh, generate color function is in the companion object. We need to initialize this since it's Swift and call generate RAM color. So, by default, we choose a random color here. Then we create a constructor here, actually not with all these values, hell no. Um, just a constructor that uh, takes the node data source like this. And we say self node data source is node data source. Then uh, the first function for this view model will be load node if exists which does exactly that. It loads the node if the ID is not nil. So if ID, um, actually we want to pass this here, ID int 64 and null. If the ID is not nil, we, again, this colon, <laughs> we want to say self dot node ID is this ID. And we want to say node data source, get node by ID, pass the ID here, um, we can assert this is not null. And then we get the node and the error from our DB, which we can then show in our states. So node title is node.title, 
node content is node dot content. We also need to probably add a null check here and assign an empty text instead if the node doesn't exist. And the node color is node dot color hex. And if that doesn't exist, um, we again choose a random color. So node dot companion dot generate random color. And it seems we need the self modifier here, the self keyword, since we are inside of a callback. So let's just add this here to these properties. And then we already have this first function. The next function is to save a node or to update a node. Function save node. And we also want a callback here on saved, which um, is called here yeah, when the node is saved. So then we can uh, properly navigate away to our previous screen and then reload the nodes there. And here we actually need to annotate this with escaping to um, be able to call this here inside of our completion handler, which simply um, yeah, returns nothing. We can then easily call node data source, insert node. The node we want to insert is one we want to create here. So new node, ID is Kotlin long of our node ID. And if our node ID is actually not existent, then we kind of want to set this to null. So how can we achieve this? We can first of all check if node ID is equal to nil. If that's true, then we want to kind of leave it at nil and else we want to assign a Kotlin long to this ID. So if there is an existent ID, we want to uh, use this or node ID, assert that's not null and else we just leave it at nil. So a new ID will be generated. The title will be node title or self node title, self node content, self node color created will be date time util dot now and the completion handler will be um, error in what happens if uh, that was completed we want to call on saved like this and one last thing then we're done with this view model that's a function to actually just set the parameters of this no detail view model just as we did before with set no data source so function set params on the one hand the no data source like this and not nullable actually, and the node ID, um, which is nullable. So in here we can say self node data source is node data source and self node ID is node ID. Oh, we actually don't need to assign this here. We can also say load node if exists and pass our node ID here, we get as a parameter. So as soon as we set the parameters, we also load the node. Mm, maybe we should also reflect that in the name set params and load, load node, something like that. And then we can now use this view model in our node details screen. So in here, we're going to have a state object again, for the same reason I mentioned before, which is a var view model is equal to a node detail view model. And by default, the node data source is nil here. So for the UI here in our body, we first of all want to have a V stack just for our two text fields in the end um, in here. Let's open this. We want to have a text field, just uh, the same as an Android here for Swift. This directly supports hint, luckily. The hint would be enter a title. The text would be dollar view model, note title. And we want to set a font, which is title. Then we can also have this other text for enter some content. And this one will have the text view model note content and we don't want to change the text here uh, I mean the the font but we want a text field not a text a text field like this we also want to make sure that these two text fields stick to the start so um, alignment is leading and that's actually already it for this v stack now one more thing we want to do is want to add a toolbar since we need a back button to go back and a toolbar adds that. We can do this with this toolbar modifier. Toolbar content, and this needs to um, return a view here, which in the end is just our uh, check, uh, check icon that we can uh, update the node since here we don't use a floating action button. So just button action is this, and the content of this button is, what is it? An image with the system name check mark. And the action will be view model. Save node. Mm. And when that was successful, 
then this piece of code will be called. And here we actually want to navigate back. So we kind of want to pop the back stack. And to achieve this in Swift UI, we can use something um, called an environment annotation. Above here, we can say an add environment. And that's, as far as I understood it, it's similar to or comparable at least to context in Android, which just gives us um, yeah, references to things like color scheme, uh, the locale, but also to things like um, the current screen, which we can then dismiss with that. So we can say environment, and then in parentheses, we want to say backslash dot presentation mode to refer, we are referring to, uh, no, to specify, we are referring to the presentation mode, which contains information about, um, yeah, the backstack equivalent of iOS. Call this um, var presentation, and then we can use this uh, presentation variable here to actually navigate back. So we can say self presentation dot wrapped a value that dismiss. So that's pretty much the same as popping the back stack on Android. We then want to go um, after this toolbar modifier. We want to say we add some default padding. We want to say we have a background, the background of our node color. So we can say we construct a new color and here we now have this hex overload, which we, yeah, which I mentioned before, which we custom, uh, which we created a custom version for. And that will be the view model node color. And if this view appears, the very outer view, then we want to call view model set params and load node. Here we pass our node data source and the node ID will be our node ID if it exists. And we do get an error here. Did I make this nullable? No, actually I did not want to make this nullable here. Then we do get an error here. This one should not be nullable. And now we are good. Cool. Um, let's replace this with an empty view instead. So it doesn't break our build process, but we should be fine to launch our app now. I will do this and we will see if there are any issues. Build succeeded. There we go. Here is the app. And oh, I still have the code in here <laughs> to which adds the node. Let's remove this first. Nodeless view model and remove this piece of code in a set node data source and relaunch. Then let's first of all try to delete some nodes, these ugly red ones. That works. So we can delete our nodes. We don't have a fancy animation as an Android, uh, but let's not care about that. Let's try to search for nodes, which is, uh, for example, test. That works. Um, content. Yes, searching works pretty fine. We can toggle this stuff here. We can hopefully add something. You can see uh, that does not look like what we want because um, because what? I am not sure because, ah, because we, if we go back to our node list screen, here we still have this empty view. We need to replace this with a node detail screen because that's what, where we want to navigate to. And this as well, node detail screen. And this will take the node data source and it will take the node ID where we want to navigate. And that's simply our selected node ID. Let's relaunch. There we go. If we click on plus, then we still need to fill the whole size. Okay, another issue. But apart from that, that looks fine. <laughs> let's go back to no detail screen to make sure we fill the whole size. Let's make sure we add a spacer here to just occupy all the space. Oh, oops, that's Android. Here's iOS. If we click plus, now we actually fill the whole size. We can also actually change these icons here to a black color. Uh, we need to do that in our navigation view. But let's first of all try to enter a title here. Note title, note content, click check. We navigate back and here's our new note. So that's working perfectly fine. Let's try if we can edit a note. Clicking here, we load it. It reflects in our UI, test update and content as well. Click check, yes. Everything seems to work perfectly fine. That was a very long video. Let's quickly also change the color here, as I said, by going to iOS app. And for this navigation view, we are going to choose an accent color of black. And then if we relaunch this just one last time, we will see black actions, which looks a lot better now. So that is very cool. We just built our very first multi-platform app, our very first working and a little bit useful in multi-platform app. Of course, that was still a lot of platform specific code we wrote here. And it's, um, at least to me, it feels like we, we built two 
separate native apps. But of course, the bigger your app gets, the more you will benefit from this shared code section for such a node app that wouldn't really be worth it to make that in KMM. You can also make this in Flutter with a single code base. But as soon as things get more complex and you need two native apps, especially if with native behavior, like if you need things like sensors, um, video rendering, all this hardware specific stuff, then you need native apps. And with KMM, you can very easily do this because you can write native code for each platform individually while sharing everything you want to share um, or while sharing everything you don't need to wide individually for each platform. So at this point, I have to say thank you so much for watching this very long video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to see more KMM content in future on my channel, then let me know that down below. Leave a subscribe if you want to see more of Android, of KMM, maybe iOS, if you also want to see pure iOS tutorials. Would also be cool to know that how many actually are interested in that or if I should rather stick to Android. And Again, a little uh, self-promo here. If you are considering to become the best version of yourself as an Android developer and you want to be personally mentored by me, then check the first link in the video description to apply for my next round of my mentorship program. Thanks again. Enjoy your day and the rest of your week and I'll see you back in the next video. Bye-bye.